The following is an interview with Matt Hoops, lead guitarist of the soundtrack of my childhood and still one of my favorite bands to today, Reliant K. He's now also launched a pedal company called 1981 Inventions, and we discuss the journey that he has been on from getting started playing guitar at a later age than I expected, going on tour shortly thereafter, and then to the point where he's at right now with his company, 1981. This was a fantastic interview. I learned so much about him, about myself, and about pursuing things that you love above pursuing what you think you ought to do. I hope you enjoy. Who introduced you to music from a playing it standpoint, not just consuming it? Yeah, uh, my mom taught me how to play the guitar. So she plays guitar. She has a nylon string classical guitar, and she she plays uh, mainly like like '60s '70s folk style, uh, finger picking, Peter Paul and Mary kind of like nice that kind of world. And she would pull out her guitar, and I just you know wanted to learn Nirvana songs or whatever. <laughs> and <laughs> uh, I. But she was the one, she was so supportive and so understanding of the fact that maybe I didn't want to learn piano like she wanted me to learn. But mm -hmm. the fact that I, I was drawn to a guitar, she was very supportive of that and took me down to the music store and bought me my own guitar and uh, was very supportive in teaching me chords, how to strum the guitar, how to, um, you know, kind of do very simple things that could that really started me off uh a, a step ahead of uh, of where I would have been, I think, you know, so. Were there certain fundamentals that you felt were essential for you getting up or getting up and getting going when you're first learning guitar or were you, it was just the ability to explore, getting those basics and then really having the freedom to run where you wanted to? Yeah, for me, it was when I learned, when I learned how to play a specific song. Uh, was a really uh, catalyst turning point in my plan. And that happened really early. So I was learning, uh, you know, just kind of like whatever I was listening to at the time. Uh, and it's it's all like kind of embarrassing. You know, like Nirvana is a cool reference, which I was, uh, was into learning their songs. And their songs have a way of being uh, overtly simple, you know, on purpose, which is hmm. a cool uh thing as a guitar player uh but still very powerful and important and it just feels cool to play those chord progressions even you know like a lot of their songs but i was also into you know like uh, a lot of christian music jars of clay i learned i think that whole their whole first record i learned uh like hootie and the blowfish i yeah. learned their whole first record. i loved it I, this is how, I thought it was cool and it was uh also like attainable like mm. I, w I was like these guys aren't like shredding playing uh chord progressions and time signatures that i can't understand like these are like three and four chord pop songs that make sense to me and when i learned how to play those songs it really just unlocked this whole i think creative side to move from there thinking about when you went from okay this is fun and did you ever have your mind set on like a career that you were going to do? And this was like guitar was just something that you were enjoying. Like how old were you at this point when you're starting to kind of unlock some of these songs, get some aptitude in guitar? And where were you thinking your life was going at that point? Yeah, I was a little older. I was probably 15 or 16 uh, when I started playing the guitar, when I picked up a guitar, when I bought my first guitar. Wow. Uh, I was I was older and. Man, I. um I never really thought that I would do it uh, professionally. Although looking back uh, in my junior year of high school, I quit playing basketball uh, because I wanted to be free on Friday and Saturday night to play shows. So you because, were you know, playing shows, but you didn't see it as something you're like, you just enjoyed it. Yeah, I just enjoyed it. Oh. Yeah, and and I, I think early in high school, I thought... Uh, you know, maybe basketball for me could be a path to a college scholarship or, or just even to be able to play on the, on that level. And I think by my junior year, I was like, you know what, I, I still enjoy basketball, but it's it doesn't feel like that's the route I even want at this point, you know, and, and doing music felt very fresh and um, it, it just exciting to me. You know, that, that was the thing that I, I couldn't wait to go play my guitar. I couldn't wait to go. Mm practice uh write new songs play with our friends uh and really that was the beginning of reliant k 
uh, was, you know, in, in high school. And so who is Reliant K made up of and where and how did that all start? Yeah, so Reliant K has been a lot of different things, but it's the core of it is is me and Matt Thiessen, uh, the singer. And so even now we we kind of brand ourselves as Matt and Matt plus friends. Uh, so okay. we'll, we'll bring out, you know, a friend to play bass or a friend to play drums. We've had a on our, our last record that we released, we had uh, two different drummers uh, play on it. Um, we've had former drummers come out and play bass uh, on tours. We've had our producer come out and play with us. Nice. Uh, so we just try to have fun with it. Uh, currently, we have um, Dave, who is kind of like our main drummer, Dave Douglas, uh, and he is... Uh, wanting to do things full on so we're yeah so it's it's now kind of matt and matt and dave and friends and uh yeah so we'll uh <clears throat> excited for what's next really cool i want to get into more of what's <clears throat> next and kind of all that but i'm oh, really yeah, curious yeah. about like the start like you said you're playing shows how do you go from learning the guitar to you and matt playing shows like what what was the sequence of events like what happened there yeah it happened very quickly uh i remember having little to no experience playing guitar when we recorded our first album. So like our first, our, and this is our first demo really. Okay. You know? So this is not, but it was a recording experience, you know, it was in uh, our friend's dad's basement, you know, it had a couple recording pieces of equipment and uh, he ended up becoming our producer what? Uh, for several albums after that. And he, uh, you know, but we we went into the studio and I, I had been playing guitar, I think, for months at this point. Uh, and I didn't know anything. And I I'd obviously never been in a recording situation, uh, but we all just kind of jumped in and I wanted to do it so badly. I mean, I would play for hours. Uh, mm. I would just I would just play around the house. I would pick up a guitar while I was watching TV and play along with uh commercials on the you know and t yeah, you know just, so cool. i just like wanted to learn i wanted to, i wanted to have it in my hands uh and so that process happened pretty quickly so what what gave you the confidence to say yeah let's like record an album yeah i don't know I, a lot of that is matt teeson matt uh, matt was uh very much a driver uh in the business side early on okay uh as far as let's do shows let's do this let's invite all our friends and he also is a you know and remains to be a prolific songwriter but i mean he was writing songs when before he knew how to play a chord he was writing songs he would just play one note and then play another note and he would start singing something and he didn't even know what he was doing but it was it's cool you know and huh. it's it's funny to um see his uh, that has always been his inclination. You know, I talked about what uh, kind of drove me to creativity was learning other people's songs. And Matt never did that. He never really wanted to do that. So he would just tinker. Yeah. And he would, and so he would just kind of like find his own path. And that's what he was really interested in. And it made it uh, and it, it worked well with what I was doing at the time, you know, so it, it was it was. Uh, I think we were we were coming at it from different angles, but we were um, both uh, equally excited about it. So you were excited to play, and he was excited to create. So he would uh -huh. create something, you would play it, you guys would do it together, and so it was like this this teamwork of like, here's what I want to do, and you're like, okay, cool, yeah, I could do that. Yeah, yeah, it's, I, uh, I think I found creativity differently later, uh, and. And it looked a little different. And I think that I'm still finding my creativity. You know, I'm still, uh, I just, uh, I don't know. When I, th when I think back on it, I, I never really thought of myself as creative starting out. Um, but I think that my creativity just looks different than his. And, mm -hmm. and he is such a great writer. He's such a prolific writer. It was almost like, you know, reading the Dave Grohl book and he talks about uh, Kurt Cobain and being around him and that feeling that he would get when kurt would bring a new song and i'm like you know i'm not trying to put matt on that level but i can relate to what that feels like and you're you you kind of almost feel like you just want to get out of the way as a, as a writer as a creator so what would you say is the cliche version of creativity and what would you say you've found over the years is your now personal definition of creativity 
Yeah, I think I think early on I thought that creativity meant you had to be uh, outlandish, wacky, weird, uh, really unique, uh, really having uh, creating something that no one had ever seen or heard before. And uh, now I think I more define it as um, expression, you know, expressing something that that you feel or a part of yourself or a part of your experience. And everyone, everyone can do that. Um, you know, I haven't I haven't even really started the book yet, but the uh, Rick Rubin has a new book mm. and I love this exercise that he does. I won't, I won't even go through it, but he he's like, uh, think of a box, think of a box in the desert. How big is the box? Can you see through it? Uh, you know, and, and it just brings you through this whole process where uh, he was, and by the end of it, he was like, okay, you, you just, you were creative. That's mm. what being creative is. I told you what all those things were and you were picturing what your version of what I told you uh, was. And that to me is creativity and everyone can be creative. So it's your version of reality. Yeah. Yeah. It's, it's, it's some sort of seeing something in your mind and uh, expressing it in some sort of physical way. So creativity is not just an idea; it's actually taking that idea and putting life to it. Or is it? Yeah, just maybe. The idea? Uh, and again, yeah, like I, I'm not trying to um, get what he's saying wrong. <laughs> but, oh, it's fine. Yeah, but yeah, it's also. Uh, I think, and then I, th I think, yeah, there is that part to. Um, okay, then now, how do you want to um, portray that in in a painting or a song mm -hmm. or a um, drawing or a writing about it? Um, how do you want to portray that thing that you just thought of? Uh, what, whatever it is. How much of what you've been able to accomplish is uh, inspiration or how much of it is just raw hard work? Uh, I lean into inspiration. I am constantly waiting for that moment to feel right. And I think I do it probably to a fault with hard work as well. My uh, my wife Laura always says that I, you know, am able to do just an enormous amount of work in a very short time if I want to do it. Hmm. Uh, but then sometimes I will kind of ebb and flow. Uh, you know, I'm not like a nine to five, and it's difficult for me to um, show up consistently. Uh, it's difficult for me to work within specific, uh, parameters of, uh, this is my exact schedule from nine to nine 45. I'll do this. And, hmm. um, I think a lot of that is from, you know, my, my experience, my adult life experience has been playing in a band and, you know, going around and doing different things. And, yeah. uh, but that, that is an area of growth that I want to get to. Um, but to answer your question, uh, Oftentimes, yeah, I, I want to wait until the until until something hits me or it feels right, and uh, the 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 thing that I am now learning is that sometimes creativity doesn't show up unless you show up, you know. So it's like putting on the guitar, just seeing what comes out, mm -hmm. just uh, being open to uh, concepts and ideas, and and really open to creativity. Is the yeah? Have you found that the first idea is that usually the result, or is there something that morphs in it? Uh, I am also a long form uh, tweaker. Okay, uh, I, I it's difficult for me to finish. Uh, it's difficult for me to call something done. Hmm. Um, even and this this is true in songwriting. Uh, it's true in uh designing guitar pedals uh it's it, it took me about four years to do my first pedal and it was on and off because we were on the road and i was i was learning uh, and working with a friend on that design and then the second pedal uh has has i was like oh of course this will only take me a year or two and it's taken about four years now. <laughs> it's on the okay. second pedal okay and so now i'm thinking uh, uh all that to say it's difficult for me to say for me to stop tweaking something. I'm kind of constantly molding and turning. Uh, but I also find that some of my most natural, um, my most natural expressions of creativity happen effortlessly. It's, it's mm. the, it's the first time. 
it's the 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 idea that you have in your head and you just sit down and sing it and strum it and it feels right and you're like oh that that was just right uh or even even this the other day i was working on a concept for a t-shirt design for uh for 1981 and i sat down and I was using an iPad. I've never used an iPad to draw. And I don't consider, I don't enjoy drawing. That is like not something that I do. Mm. Uh, but I just picked it up and I drew multiple layers really quick. And I was just opening new layers and making a blank page because I just kept trying it again and again. Mm. And when I opened it up to show my wife, she was like, wait, it looks kind of cool with all of them open. And I was like, oh, wow. Yeah, that's I never even would have thought to do that. And I was like, I, I think it's done. Like, I don't, you know, like it's like, that was going to be the product. That was it. And it was just, cool. you know, like, um, eight Oh five in the morning, I'm drinking coffee and just like doing that thing, not thinking about it. No pressure. No, like not even really a, a picture in my mind of what I was after. And just I think that, that turned out really cool. So just experimenting. How much of the work that you do is necessary that actually builds towards the inspirational moment. You ever thought about that? Hmm. Yeah, I, or are you talking about like uh, practicing a p process in order, you know, like a, a skill set? Yeah, uh, you wouldn't be ready for the inspiration if you didn't have the ability to execute on it. That's so true. Yeah, uh, I think about that when I think back to um, my first experiences, it, you know, in a studio or running a studio. Is that that? that really helped me understand more so that uh that ability to um have have even some uh experience in engineering uh in in recording a guitar signal and recording a vocal and running a pro tool session is uh really helpful really useful in in uh creativity <laughs> because there are a lot of times when i can have an idea but it just seemingly lives forever as a barely listenable you know iphone voice memo you know mm. uh so i think about those kinds of things where um l first learning to have more uh of an understanding of how to even do basic recordings uh really kind of changed my uh approach to creativity i think it opened a lot of doors i'll say that what how do you approach so you okay? Let's go back to you and Matt entering the studio for the first time. Uh huh. Super wet behind the ears. Have no idea yeah, what's going yeah. on. You're just like, all right, Matt. I trust you. Let's go record a couple of songs. Uh huh. Was it literally you just like sitting down? Somebody stuck a mic in front of you, and then they were executing the recording. You were just being the talent, so to speak. Yes, and that that's really been the case. I mean, I've I've wanted to learn along the way. I've always been interested in, you know, what microphone are we using? How are you doing those edits? Uh, but I never really had to sit down and uh, figure it all out myself. Ever? Uh, well, for or, the first 10 years we okay. were recording. Yeah, probably. Okay. Uh, but yeah, so our first experience was uh, we went in and... Um, you know, the guy who was recording was like, okay, you know, how many songs do you want to do? And we were only, we were only recording for one day. And okay. we said, we want to do 11. And he was like, there's no way you're going to get 11 songs. And we're like, well, we just, we've been practicing a lot. And so we were like, our thought was we'd play through the first half of the day. We'd play through all the songs, record them all. And then after that, we'll record all the vocals on the second half of the day. So you play all instruments uh -huh. and then do all vocals. Yeah. And so we did it. Dang. Yeah. So what what led you to be able to do that your first time in a studio? He doubts you and you guys still go for it anyway. You record all 11 songs in your first. Yeah. E it's an EP. It's not even an EP. That's like a full album. Yeah, yeah. So we, and we call it our demo. It's called yeah. it's called All Work and No Play. And you can still, unfortunately, uh, hear it. Uh, is it on Spotify right now? No, it's not on Spotify. Okay. Uh, it is probably YouTube would be your best bet. Uh, but it yeah, it is painful to listen to is it uh, labeled under reliant k had you guys named yeah, yourselves yeah. that uh-huh yeah okay let's take a quick detour where did reliant sure. k come from uh it was the name of my car so it was an old plymouth uh they call it the k car okay uh, my grandmother was a uh rural mail carrier 
and so she ha- she wanted to have a car uh that she could slide across a bench seat to put the mail in the people's post uh, in people's mailboxes okay and uh so she did that for a few years it was this old beater rusted out it it was near the end of its life okay. uh and she gave it to my or my dad bought it off of her and then my dad gave it to me as, okay. as when i turned 16 and it just kind of became an inside joke with our friends where we, you know, people would call it the the rust bucket or we would, you know, stop uh, on the road and try to time it zero to 60 and it'd be like 20 seconds, you know, it, just, <laughs> it was so slow and just hilarious. And I just put all these um, band stickers all over the back of it and it just kind of became an inside joke with all of our friends. We were all, we were always joking about how nerdy this car was. And, you know, because it's just boxy and old and yeah. it's just falling apart, really. You know, like, uh, so we decided to name our band after it. So I think it was Matt's idea, actually. It's sunny because it's I think I remember one of your first albums I listened to was I believe it was a picture of the back of the car. Right. Like, I remember I'm, seeing I'm trying to remember Reliant uh, K on a car somewhere in your album history. It's very, very possible. Yes. <laughs> How many, um, uh, uh, let's go, let's keep moving through that first recording. So you guys do that recording. Is that an album that you guys kind of in a, like, did you start touring that? When did you start? Like, when did you start picking up momentum? So you record, you are doing shows in Ohio. Yep. You record this album. So let's see, we're at, Matt's been playing for six months ish. Yeah. Matt and Matt record an album, name it Reliant K. Mm-hmm. We're now at about probably eight months. Where where do we go from there? Where does Reliant K take off to from there? Yeah, I'll I'll try to get it right. But uh, our producer uh, was playing, or the guy that recorded our demo, uh, he used to play uh, guitar for the band DC Talk. They were like an yeah. old Christian rock rap band. Uh, and... So he was on the road with with them, and Toby, the singer, asked him. He's like, "Hey, you know, play me some of the stuff you've been recording, you know, because he knew he had uh, built a recording set, set up in his house in Ohio." Cool. And so he played him a couple things, and then uh, Toby was like, "Well, wait, what's that? What's that other one in your bag?" And he wasn't even going to play it, and it was our. And he was like, "Oh, that's just a demo I made for some kids." And he was like, "Okay, yeah, let, let me hear that." And he put it on, and he said, "That's this is what I want." Yeah, like get these guys on the phone, you know? So Toby, wow. Toby was really a catalyst probably way before we were ready, uh, for it. And, uh, so he, you know, met with us, we signed initially a developmental deal. Uh, they, they had told us, uh, you know, get ready to tour. We, we were just entering Whoa. our senior year of high school. And so I went on a fast track to graduate high school halfway through the year. Uh, so you had I, to like, hustle. I dealt, yeah, I doubled. Dang. I doubled all my classes mm. and just graduated uh, after first semester of uh, my senior year. Dang. And then we sat around for almost a year waiting for songs to get approved. Uh, I ended up going to college for that whole year. Uh, so my, you kept going on life. You're my, like, my dad this might happen. Yeah, it my dad not. worked at a college, so I could go for free. So okay. I was just like, okay, yeah, I'll just. I'll, do some college while while I'm waiting. We're still playing shows regionally yeah. at that point, but we're we're just waiting around. And I think at this point we had an album recorded. I want to say it was almost a year before it came out. I think our our first uh, self titled album was recorded at least nine months, if not more than a year uh, before it came out. Wow! So you did the demo, then Mac Mac. Oh yeah, uh, Mac. Wait, Toby. Oh, Toby, Toby Mac. Toby yeah, Mac. yeah. Toby, Toby Mac, yeah. who now is self-titled. So, yeah, as well. yeah. He okay. does a solo thing. Yeah. Now. So yeah. Toby Mac finds you guys. Uh huh. And then you guys record another album in whose studio? The same. The studio? same studio. Yeah. Okay. Just in the basement. So Mark uh, invested in some more gear, uh, built out some more isolation rooms, and we just did it there. Cool. So, yeah. And then you're waiting college. When does the tour start? You're touring with Toby Mac at the time. Oh no, DC no, Talk? you're touring we, by yourselves. We've never toured with Toby Mac. Okay. Uh, oh no, uh, one time, well, okay. one time, and it was uh, probably uh, ten years ago. But uh, okay, yeah, we uh, 
Yeah, we started touring. Uh, our first tour was with Bleach and PAX 217. And it was it was almost a year after they told us we would have to start touring. OK. Uh, and we uh, were able to get on that tour. And then right after that, we did uh, Fiverr and Frenzy and the W's. And then right after that, we did our own tour. So we we were just once we hit the road, we were just gone. You Dang. know, we uh, were just out and playing shows and learning and um, trying to have fun. Yeah. <laughs> so what would you say um, is the difference between when you guys got your start? I'm just super curious about this question because I know there's a lot of people who want to get their start as yeah. musicians. What would you say is the biggest difference between when you guys started what it took to get on the road and what what the difference of what it is now in the industry yeah when people ask me that uh i almost don't know how to answer them I, i'm almost like whatever information i can tell you it's it's like trying to explain uh computer programming from the 70s you know yeah, it's like it's, totally it, it doesn't it's not applicable now yeah. it's a, that's not our culture that's not the world that we live in and what happened to us, even at the time, was very rare. Yeah, uh, it was a really unique scenario. We were not looking to sign to Goatee Records. We we're not looking to sign to a Christian record label. We we wanted to be on Tooth and Nail Records. That was like our goal because we loved punk rock music and yeah. we wanted to just be on the same label as MXPX and Goatee Hook and Slick Shoes and all these bands that we listened to growing up and. Uh, we were even like, is this even the right fit to, mm. you know, uh, to do this? But, you know, Toby was so great. Uh, he really believed in us and, st and still does. And I'm still honest. I'm very grateful to him, uh, for taking a chance on us, but That's also cool. for continuing to, um, support us over the years has been, really meant a lot. That's so cool. I just did a, a video interview up in Nashville and I was going, I was going back and forth on on uh, trying to remember everything and then i i don't think i said half the things that i wanted to say you know what somehow. were you what were you what was the story you were telling on this interview uh i wanted to tell the story of my new pedal the lvl okay uh and just you know just explain wh where it came from why it took so long why i love it um what it sounds like and a lot of it i wanted to tie back to the band because uh i mean that's my that has been my approach to guitars largely through the band and uh it was uh so i, I connect my first pedal the drv to our mm -hmm record from 2004 yeah and then this pedal my new pedal the lvl is connected to uh or forget not slow down record in 2009 when you say connected do you mean the sound that you were going yeah, for on that it, album you were trying to recreate that yeah and and so that that kind of became a major part of the story uh where uh to me that felt important to recreate that not only that era but moving forward from that era and um just trying to capture a bit of uh that felt like the unique part about what i was doing was that i was going after a sound that i had already gotten uh using different things wow uh different pieces and so that that kind of became this uh this new thing so let's uh, we're here let's dive in oh yeah, what, yeah i don't mean to yeah. what do you what did you find on the mm -hmm album that you wanted to recreate and is 1981 pedals almost a search for capturing and containing a nostalgic part of your life or a nostalgia in the yeah. album yeah i mean i think even just with the the name of the company you know 1981 is the year i was born and uh, but not only that, it is uh, when I start. I've I've always been a pedal collector, but at one point, it, yeah, it it went crazy. At one They're point, it went crazy. I love it. Uh, it just uh, got out of control. And okay, what is out of control? How many pedals did you have? I mean, hundreds. So you know, would you just not, like would you be on tour and you just go to guitar shops and just and just pick up used or like what? How? Yeah, what I is think this? When uh, I would do that. Uh, I think when um, Reverb.com first launched, I very much got addicted to it. I was just <laughs> constantly scrolling yeah. and I would say, oh, this random boss pedal from the 80s just came up and it's 
super cheap. I'm just going to buy it. It's one in the morning, you know, yeah. I'm sitting, you know, sitting on the tour bus somewhere. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. So that's, that's, that's probably my main ad addiction and collection kind of started around that time. But, uh, were you using them on tour? Were you testing them out or were they literally just pieces of art to you? Oh, that's interesting. Um, yes, I was using them and often I, wouldn't use the ones that I was pretty sure I was going to use. And sometimes there were sleeper pedals that I, this, you know, completely changed my approach. Uh, I didn't, I didn't, I thought maybe this was just going to be a cool box to have in my house that maybe I would use sometimes. And uh, there were things that really uh, affected me in a big way and, and really kind of um, sent me on a different path uh, as far as my uh, as a guitar player and mm. uh that's actually the the inspiration for the company you know so i started uh i was born in 1981 but also right around this time i bought a 1981 a tube screamer from 1981 and also a rat pedal from 1981 and then and then also one from 1985 and the one from 1985 was actually the one that most can it most sent me on my path uh, but that became inspiring. Whereas before I was interested in tweaking, uh, and modifying and, um, creating, whereas all of a sudden I felt a lot of inspiration from these like very early classic devices that were like very early iterations of the circuit. And I was like, man, there's, it feels like there's magic in here. So like the rawness of analog. Yeah, it's it's kind of that. And it's uh, a lot of what happens with guitar pedals is, the, you know, there's age and part tolerances. And, you know, there are different things within the pedal that make it sound different from one pedal to the next. Uh, and especially on older pedals, this is true. And I feel very strongly about my... 1981 tube screamer from the year 1981 not not my not yours yes. okay, okay. Uh, but i feel very strongly that that pedal is special and it to me sounds different uh to me there's it's it's inspiring it's somewhat magical hmm. uh and i don't really care if anyone else thinks differently uh and so but my goal was in creating it, it sent me on a new path creatively uh, with doing the uh, DRV circuit for 1981 Inventions. Uh, and not that I wanted to recreate these old pedals exactly part for part, is that I just wanted to find some of that magic that was in there, that that where the old pedal felt special, felt important, it felt um, in, in some ways uh, organic, or it, it like there was some feeling in there. Um, so what did you do to to find that? I mean, what what do you? How are you going through that process? You said you were create, starting to do this on tour when you were touring. Yeah, what yeah. year was? What year did you start the process of doing these pedals? And how did you find it? Yeah, it was probably that 2014. Um, I met a guy uh, named John Ashley. He has a company called Bondi Effects. We were playing a show in Louisville, Kentucky, and. Um, I had two amps with me on the time on, uh, on tour and the, the night before, I guess there was a power surge and it blew all of the tubes and all of my amps. Oh my uh, and it was only on my side of the stage. Oh. Uh, and so we got to the next show and plugged them in. Nothing's working. It's like a Sunday. We can't get tubes. We can't get a tech out there. Uh, and I, I just don't have an amp. So I call my friend that lives in Kentucky and he is like, uh, he, he was on the road at the time, but he was like, Hey, my buddy ha has a bunch of cool guitar gear. He's happy to bring, bring an amp down for you to borrow for tonight. And it was John, okay. uh, who does Bondi effects. And, and so John brought an amp down was super kind, uh, generous. And I was very thankful that he brought it down. And then he was like, Oh, Hey, also I make my own pedals. And I was like, I was like, yeah, man, I'm happy to try it out. And he said, oh, I'm happy to give you one. And at the time I was like, uh, you know, I, I don't, I had had a bad experience with, with handmade pedals at the time where I was, uh, had tried multiple handmade pedals and they kept breaking on, on tour. 
And also they, I was worried that they sounded weird. So I was just not into this like boutique kind of li like line of thinking. Uh, mm -hmm. But I said, I'm happy to try out your pedal. But I was like, honestly, I don't know if I'm going to use it. Uh, and he was like, okay, we'll try it out. And he started explaining to me what, what the circuit was and how he came to it. And I was like, oh no, that does sound really interesting. Plugged it in, loved it immediately, put it on my board and it's been on my board ever since. You that, know, like that, that pedal from that time. Yeah. That pedal. For, well, yeah. and I've had different iterations of that cool. circuit. Uh, but that that was really meaningful to me. And I was like, oh, wow, I really appreciate his approach as a hand built boutique guitar maker. Uh, I appreciated his attention to detail, his attention to design, uh, his attention to uh, the sonic qualities and engineering uh, that he that he had. And so I approached him and I was like, hey, I want to make a heavier distortion pedal. I want to I want to make something that is for me and I want to put it out through your company. Can can you can you help me do it? You know, like, yeah, I, I would love to just just do this. And I think it could make sense for both of us. I'm not even looking to make money off of it. Uh, I just I kind of just want to make this pedal that is specific. So uh, it's getting your feet wet, experimenting, just taking a new yeah. step, new step of creativity. I I wasn't even sure what I was after. I didn't know how to. um engineer a guitar pedal i didn't really even know what i was after but i i knew that i wanted to make something that did a specific thing that i didn't think was available because i was like i've tried everything i try everything that comes out uh, i try every vintage thing i can get my hands on and there's still something there's something more that i want but it's close okay so we're going back <clears throat> to the first pedal was for the mm -hmm album yeah yeah what how did you get this sound for the album was it like an arrangement of pedals that just perfectly assembled to create this sound that you had on that album uh it was, what, like what happened to that sound how did it get lost oh yeah it it didn't get lost uh but there's a specificity to recording guitars that is different uh than like touring uh and and micro mm. microphones and uh it's different than sitting in your room uh and playing guitar and okay so, so you wanted to be able to hear that sound when you were just enjoying time sitting and playing yeah so the mm -hmm record was the first album that we approached in this way where we wanted cohesion we wanted uh the guitars to uh, we wanted the album to feel uh like it was all in the same plane and we had never really tried to tried to do this before, but we started off and so we got one guitar sound and we said, we're going to put that guitar sound as a bass level on every single track. And okay. so we went through and we played one guitar uh, throughout every single song on the album. And then we went back and added different flavors and um, sounds and hmm. effects and different things. But it was like that one baseline tone so we took a long time to get that sound and what we did is in the studio uh we uh mixed multiple amps together we mixed mul multiple microphones together and so really that sound is more of a uh a mixture of a couple of those things gotcha. so uh as far as what it is it's not um it's not entirely complex it is a one pedal uh, an old rat pedal that i had through my old marshall amp and then it is a little bit of a mesa boogie which is like a newer a dual rectifier which is like a newer uh, more modern sounding amp and then it's a little bit of a 60s sears silver tone uh you know like an old uh you know it's like the white stripes amp it's okay like the uh you know it's an amp like death cab for cutie would use yeah uh, all of those mixed together and then also this is our first time um really messing with different microphones and we started using you know, like a royer 121 ribbon mic which mm -hmm. uh that uh by itself is probably too warm and washy and not aggressive enough but when you mix it with other microphones uh it, it becomes something cool and just uh, very warm and wide but also clear yeah. and uh that was kind of part of the essence that i was trying to 
capture with the DRV pedal. Yeah, so you're literally trying to recreate all of that whole combination. Yeah, I, I, and as I much wanted, as you can and I wanted pedal. that feeling. Yeah. Uh, wow. So it's funny, you know, when I finally uh, released the final version of the pedal, uh, you know, our band had stopped touring for almost a year at that point. Hmm. Uh, this is 2018. And it was not until this last year, 2022, that I played a Reliant K tour with the final version of the DRV. And I loved it. It was like everything that I had hoped it would be, you cool. know, like it was, uh, it was really cool. So. so this is as much of a personal pursuit of your own ability to play this sound as much as wanting to share this with the world. Yeah, I think that's a good way to say it. Um, it's been an interesting journey with uh, the pedal company because I I am aware that it helped me a lot to be able to start uh, with the support of people who had heard of our band before. Hmm. Uh, but right now, I think most people that follow the pedal company are not aware of the band. They maybe had never heard of the band. Wow. For me, uh, that's crazy because I grew up like listening to you guys so much. Yeah, and yeah. And I'm just like, how would you like? I'll, how did you not know who Relying K is? And wow. it's funny. It is. Uh, so our band has a very specific uh, kind of follow. You know, and there and there are a lot of people who still care about you know these songs that we did so long ago. And I yeah. think that's that's really cool. Like I'm very thankful for that. Uh, and yeah, I think we just kind of have a different kind of fan base. You know, we never really hit, we were, you know, we did MTV, we did, you know, uh, top 40 radio and things like that, but we never really like hit. We never really hmm. had like a hit song. So you didn't like go viral yeah, in a sense I don't think of so. today's yeah. words. It's, uh, you know, we came up with bands like Fall Out Boy, but they had a very different path than, than we did, hmm. you know? And, uh, I, you know, I think just, uh, not even necessarily better or worse or, you know, but I mean, they were much bigger. Like the scale was uh, not comparable. Okay, great. I love this because you never had a huge blow up in a positive way. Yeah. Do you feel like, how, okay, how do you feel about that? Do you feel like it allowed you to kind of live uh, a more balanced life or do, were you touring just as much? Because I think about it like, like you're now gonna have this pedal company, and we're here in your, where you're making them in your in your garage in this this studio that you've created, and it's just so, it's just so calm. Like I'm just, it's so comfortable just being in here. And it's like seems like it's allowed you to live a very, just not normal life. Like I hate to say it that way, no, but yeah, it just yeah. seems very like just normal, copacetic. Mm -hmm. Like still have had a very non. I don't even know what I'm trying to say, but it yeah. just feels calm in a good way. Yeah, it's it's funny. I think some people will think that, um, you know, I have to worry about the paparazzi or something. And then, some, you know, it's really not like uh, I don't often even have people recognize me in public. That is not a thing that happens very often. Um, and, yeah, I think I, th I think about that difference uh you know, with bands that we came up with, like Fall Out Boy. And I'm like, man, yeah, we have a very different, I have a very different life than them. And I I, I think I started becoming aware of that, um, you know, like watching the arc of different different uh, contemporaries and their careers. Yeah. And and I would think, you know what? Like, I'm, I'm really thankful that I get to like do this thing I love and own a house. I'm really thankful that I get, you know, and it's, yeah. it's, it's like, what am I really after in life? Like, I don't, I don't necessarily want to buy like a helicopter, you know, like, I don't feel like I need to have a house in Italy and a, you know, like yeah. that, that's not really what I'm, that's not really part of my value system. And I think, I think there is at least some, uh, you know, every, everything kind of comes with its own uh good and bad you know positive and negative uh and i think I, w I was always able to be thankful for um not only the success we had but for the you know for just just where we were and just being able to like be um content with that uh yeah grateful for that that's i that's kind of what i was aiming towards in my rant was just how you've been able to do something very much of a passion project because 
uh, let me ask, did you, did you feel like there wasn't as much of an expectation to keep that, that, you know, like for instance, as they say, sometimes a really high highs can create really hard mm -hmm. falls. Yeah. And did you feel less pressure to be able to like, Hey, I want to just invent a pedal. Like, I just mm. want to go and start this thing. Like, did, 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 did that non catapult into viral success, so to speak, give mm. you kind of that freedom to just try something new and not really worry too much about it? Yeah, I'd like to think that I would have done it regardless okay. of what had happened. But also, uh, you know, I don't know. It's uh, like if I think about this, like if I was completely 100% financially set, like I could buy an island and never worry about another dollar. Yeah. Uh, do, you know, doing a pedal company is hard. Yeah. Uh, doing a figuring out how to run a business, figuring out how to uh, put in the work. Yeah. Uh, it it takes effort and i don't know if if i didn't if if i never thought about that side of it uh i can't say for sure that it would have happened so, so i am thankful for that too this was more than just oh i want to finish this fun project it's also a part of your kind of catalog of your business pursuits yeah when i started uh the pedal company I thought, okay, this is this can be a thing where I can do it on the weekends. I can build pedals for my friends and my friends and bands that tour. And uh, this can be a fun thing that I can enjoy. And, uh, you know, maybe I'll sell 20 pedals, 30 pedals, maybe, you know. And, and I had very low expectations for what 1981 Inventions could be. Hmm. And on my f about an hour after my first release uh which i sent out an email at midnight and had sold 200 pedals r almost right away and i was like oh okay this is different and now i need to shift to now i need to figure out how to build 200 pedals you know i've never done that before i've only yeah. built three pedals at a time or six pedals at a time you know building 200 feels wow. like I don't know how to do that. That's crazy. Uh, yeah. You know, I was doing every single process by hand at that point, and it was, it's just, it's a lot for one person, so. So you, were, you built every single pedal of the first run yourself? Yeah, and really for the first year or two, I did the majority of the building, Dang. if not. Yeah, how, how many have it. you built to this point? I mean, uh, personally? Yeah. Oh, I, I, I wouldn't even know. Wow. You know? I, I have no idea. So I, the we've sold about 10, we're, all, we're almost to serial number 10,000. So Dang. that's that's kind of like a pretty big milestone for me. And, wow. Uh, it means a lot, yeah, that they're uh, still put together with love. And I do have some help now. Uh, and that has been, uh, you know, but I, I still love building. I, I love just sitting down and putting on a record, getting some coffee and just soldering you know cool. it's fun how did you capture that sound so we're, mm -hmm. we've talked about the oh yeah yeah like how did you finally get to it what i've, I've never built a pedal mm -hmm. i'm sure most people have never built a pedal they've used pedals yeah what did it take to finally find that sound from the album well i think what uh, initially we just tried a lot of different things and i said what if we took the you know kind of front end concept of this pedal and mixed it with the EQ section from this pedal. And what if we took, you know, so I was just kind of, I was kind of spitballing at first and mm. I was uh, leaning into John's uh, experience and expertise. And uh, yeah, I think for me, it was trying a bunch of different things and then realizing what I liked and didn't like. And, and I think initially when I, when I came out, when I was, uh, working on the first iterations of the pedal, I wasn't necessarily going for that album sound. Okay. I wasn't necessarily, I think it became that uh, really within the last year of design where it was like, oh no, this is like, I. it just clicked, it hit a certain point. And that's actually a similar thing with LVL. It wasn't like I set out to make the sound of an album, but it it, it started getting close and I could hear it. And then it reminded you. And and I said, oh, my goodness, we're so close to huh. that one sound. What can we do now uh, in, in the, within the gain structure, within the EQ range, uh, the mid range profile? Uh, what can we do 
in the feel of this pedal. Uh, and I know what I want those songs to sound like. So like I tell this story uh, with the new pedal with LVL, uh, where as I was testing what um, what started as a boost pedal, you know, which is is really just it's level and not gain. Uh, so it's it's just adding more signal, uh, which I, and I love boost pedals. Uh, yeah. That's like a thing that I just really enjoy. It's like a, a strange thing to be really into. I get, uh, but <laughs> it is. Uh, and I started playing uh, our song "Forget Not So Down," and it. Um, I I felt like it was almost there. So I was, I was calling, you know, my friend that I was working with on the design for this pedal, um, as a a different John, John Snyder. Um, and he, uh, was really helping me figure out some new things. I said, you know, can we add another clipping section? Can we add more gain? Is there a way to make it, uh, compress more? Is there, you know, and I started, we started talking about different ways to approach it. And so starting off as a pedal that was just meant to boost your signal, it became kind of an overdrive. It became a thing because I, because I heard in it, I, and I was trying to play our song for getting all set down. I said, it's almost there. We need a little bit more. We need the mid range to be a little different. We need uh, a little bit more compression, a little bit more gain. How can we get there? Let's try some things, you know? So we just kind of took that and we were doing it remotely. He lives in Boston. So wow. like I had a version of the pedal and he had a version of the pedal and wow. we were um, kind of just trying to get to the bottom of it. But, you know, it's it's funny, uh, all the similarities that have happened between LVL and DRV um, where, you know, I had started working with John Ashley uh, from Bondi Effects when he was in Louisville and I was in Nashville. So we were, you know, two hours away from each other and we would just meet up and hang out and work on this, work on the project. And he at one point moved, he's from Australia and he at one point moved back to Australia and I had kind of like let the pedal idea go. And it was, it was right after we kind of, uh, finished our, what, what kind of became the last Reliant K tour in 2017. And I was talking to him and he was like, Hey, let's finish that pedal. And I was like, are you coming back here ever? You know? And he was like, no, we'll just do it on FaceTime. You know, like you'll have, you'll have a setup, I'll have a setup. We'll both be listening to it and, and we'll just walk through it and, uh, we'll let's, let's finish the pedal. And so that's, that's how it is through, through FaceTime. So the, the, the first pedal was finished completely remote between you two with with your ideas and the second one is was was as well so he's still he's still over there and you oh yeah so i i worked with two different guys and we're actually we're all friends you know it's uh um and so the uh i actually worked with several different people on in the concept of creating a second pedal okay and shelved a couple of those ideas a few of them didn't work um really thankful for all the input and kind of like knowledge that I learned along the way. Um, but ended up, uh, with John Snyder, he has a company called electronic audio experiments in Boston. Wait, so John, it's John and and John John, yeah, and Matt and Matt, you got something about the name, something about (laughs) it. Yeah. Yeah. So, and, and John Snyder is, uh, he's amazing. He's a genius. He's literally a, uh, uh, has a doctorate you know he's uh he he's like a rocket scientist he has like a a a degree in like optics or something and he uh finished his degree and uh was realizing that the job offers he was getting were from like Halliburton and uh you know things like that and he was like I I don't really want to make devices that our government can kill people with, I'm just going to make fuzz pedals, I think, you know, or whatever. (laughs) And so he started. And so that's what he's been doing. And he's, uh, you know, entirely overqualified. Uh, that's fantastic. But yeah, he has a really unique approach and I I love his energy and you know what he brings to, uh, the table. And, and also he is a huge part of what makes LVL great, just in the same way that John Ashley from Bondi effects is a huge part of what makes DRV great, you know? So I, I, I started talking to John and I was like, wait, what, what is the magic in this, in this old rat pedal that I have? Like, let's, let's find it. And we were tracing out, measuring all the parts. 
trying to recreate it. And then we realized what had happened was the chip in the pedal is this old Motorola chip. Okay. It's the LM308. It's this classic, like, holy grail of uh, cheap guitar chip chipsets. Okay, so the cheapness, like that rawness of it, yeah, did something. Okay, They're really difficult to find now. Okay, uh, they go for a lot of money. There are a lot of fakes, uh, and they sound different one one to the next because they're inconsistent. Uh, and so I was like, there's this one rat pedal that I have that I love. And he figured out that if we pulled it out and measured it, what was actually happening was it was losing so much of the high end frequencies, more so like almost 60% more so than other chips that he measured. And I was like, I think that might be it. So what he this did was crazy. he graphed what that chip was losing sonically. And we recreated that uh that eq sweep oh my gosh uh, with so resistance cool. so we were running all these right. resistors into the front end of the chip but then we realized oh if we use this same chip now it's like double dark so it's it's like way too dark so we ended up using another chipset that is a more i would say vanilla sounding chipset yeah. but we're doing this intricate kind of uh filtering on the front end so the way you're mixing it it adds a lot. Of, it's like the character going into the chip uh, where using the original chip was not uh, suitable. Um, but doing it this way is kind of recreating what I love about that original chip that I had. So the intricacies of the inconsistency of that original pedal in that chip. Yeah. Was what made it you love it so much. And literally it was a. There was no other pedal that probably did that because of it was an air that was yeah creating maybe not in the it. same way yeah yeah wow so then you were able to recreate that mess up mm -hmm. but it, it does it every time yeah yeah exactly yeah wow so that's for the LVL that's for the new oh, one. oh no so that's for DRV sorry, sorry yeah. that's the original I, one. I keep bouncing back you're good back you're good okay, so that was the yeah. original one yeah that was the original one yeah, okay so. man I just yeah. think that's that is incredible you're from Ohio you ended up in Nashville. Um, you were touring for, for years. Where mm -hmm. was home while you were touring? And, and I mean, obviously Nashville is like a huge music capital capital. What's your moving in life and living journey? Yeah. Uh, I moved to Nashville in probably 2006. Uh, so we've been touring for five or six years at that point. Okay. Um, and then lived in Nashville until 2021. Okay. So what, obviously Nashville is a big opportunity to produce, record a lot of music. Um, so why leave? Yeah. Uh, it was, I can't, it's hard. It was a little difficult for me to remember, uh, that time. It was funny. We always, you know, had this kind of like anti Nashville stance as a band. We always thought, uh, we, you know, we don't need to live in Nashville. We'll just live in Ohio. It's much simpler. It's much like, you know, uh, it's just who we are, yeah. you know, and we're not trying to be anyone we're not. And, you know, we, we'd always joke that, you know, when you move to Nashville, you, that you have to buy $200 jeans and like <laughs> wear, you know, wear boots all the time and have a mustache. And we were, you know, we would always just, it was always a joke with within our band early on, and uh, you know, I think I think for me, it was a lot of it was a, a personal thing where my ex wife had wanted to be down in Nashville because her parents had moved down there from Ohio, okay, and she wanted to be able to be closer to them because I was gone so much. That makes sense. And so I was like, okay, yeah, I'm, I didn't really want to move, but I was like, I, I'm gone all the time. I get that you don't want to be by your family. Let's let's try it out. So. Yeah. So you guys ended up down there really more for family than than to be in Nashville. So yeah, to totally, totally huh. that. Uh, and uh, didn't really, uh, didn't really feel at home in Nashville until uh, 
we moved in 2008 to East Nashville. Okay. And that's when it started. I started feeling like, oh, there's a community. Here's our friends. Uh, here's uh, coffee shops that I can walk to. This It, 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 it just felt like another, um, it felt like, started feeling like home. It's a little more local life instead of yeah, this big yeah. bustling music city. I felt like I yeah, had a lot of culture, but also a lot, uh, you know, I, I had a lot of friends' houses that I could walk to. Cool. What did coming here do for you as far as creativity and where you're at with 1981? Yeah, coming to Florida, uh, I mean, this is a place that that my wife and I have been coming for the last, I don't know, uh, eight years or so, I don't know, since, since we were dating, really. Yeah. And it uh, has just always been such a happy and positive place. Um, I've, I've toured a lot. I've been in a lot of different places and there's something about the energy of right here that feels good to me. That feels like home. Uh, something about the way the light hits. And I don't mean to get too like into, uh, an abstract thought, but, uh, there are places that I've been in my life, uh, New Zealand, um, even like northern Michigan on the coast of Lake Michigan. Absolutely agree. Uh, there are places in my life that I've been that feel the w- the way I feel here. Mm. And so to me, it felt like uh, moving to a place that energetically, just as far as the, um, just the environment, just mm. where I, just how it feels outside. Uh, and obviously the beach is beautiful down here that I've been to a lot of different beaches in my life. And this one is one of my favorites in the world. And, uh, I love being able to go to see that every day. I love seeing the sunset every day. I love, uh, taking a run and going down there and just like seeing being on the beach for a minute. It's, it's really, uh, I don't want to say like spiritually impactful, but it, there is a part of that that is like meaningful to me um, that I, I really am grateful for to be down here. Yeah. What what part of Northern Michigan do you love? I mean, we my sister used to live up in Midland, and so we would go up and uh, go over to like Traverse City or Petoskey or Mackinac, um, and really that whole entire area from from Mackinac Island to Traverse City. I had never been to that part. You know, I'm from Ohio, so everyone's yeah. like, I hate Michigan. It's, a, you know, because of the Ohio State Michigan yeah, football yeah. thing. Yeah. And so I had never really thought about it. I, you know, I had been to Grand Rapids and to Detroit, obviously. Yeah. Uh, and I was like, yeah, it's it, very, it feels very Ohio ish. It might as well be Ohio to Absolutely. me. Uh, but when I got into Northern Michigan, I was like, oh my goodness, I haven't seen a gas station in an hour and a half. <laughs> And there's only trees. And this is amazing. This is beautiful. How is this so untouched? And going to Lake Michigan right there, it, I get a similar feeling to here. I'm like, how is the light hitting different? How is the sunset so beautiful? How mm. is the water just has this beautiful color to it? And it just feels peaceful uh, to be up there. There's something about um, the energy of just the environment that feels really cool. So. Yeah. And it's funny, I've met a few people that live down here that are from there. From like that, that yeah, from strip. Petoskey or yeah. from uh yeah, like different different little towns that are down. And I'm like, do you guys feel like there's a similar energy? And they're like, Totally. Yes, totally. That's that's why we wanted to be down here. So that's neat. We uh we my wife has gone to Mackinac Island every year for like wow. since she was basically born. And I, I, I'm similar to you. I'm from Ohio, kind of mid middle Ohio, yeah. uh, Toledo area. Yeah, yeah. And uh, I'd never been so again. You know Michigan. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, I was like, yeah. oh, Michigan. It's like yeah. it's like us, like but just Ann farther Arbor. up. Yeah, 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 yeah. But yeah, she took me when we got married to Mackinac, and I was like, we're coming here every year yeah, for the rest like, of our wow, lives. Wow, this is this is different. Yeah. yeah, I remember I was playing golf with my dad one night, and it was like. And I was like, man, we we were kind of waiting behind some people and it was later in the day. And I was like, man, I can't believe it's still light out. And I looked at my watch and it was like 10, 20, you know, at Whoa. night. And it was li- and I was like, this is wild being up here. This is crazy. We're still out playing golf this late, you know, and just 
uh, I just, I don't know, I just really appreciate the different sides of it. We've played shows like on the Upper Peninsula, and that's always an experience too, just because it's, you're kind of in this no man's land yeah. of uh, in between, you know, it's really cool. Yeah, because you're still in the United States, still in Michigan, and you, but you're just like, right there in the midst of Canada. Yeah, right? yeah. Yeah, but you're also not really Canada. It just feels like disconnected. Yeah. It feels like you're on this this strange island uh somewhere. Yeah. So. Uh-huh. You mentioned uh spiritually um where has your spiritual journey gone throughout? Cuz you said you came from a Christian background. Uh-huh. Yeah. So where's your spirituality gone through? Like what is that journey? Yeah. From going through the band to where you are now, what does it look like? Yeah, I mean, that is a like a massively wide question. Uh, it is. But yeah, my faith has always been really important to me. It's something that has always felt like home and like a support and like a, um, a peace, hmm. uh, you know? And, and, and I think that a lot of my theology has changed. A lot of what I, uh, what I believe in, uh, has changed. But a lot of what I value and uh, my experience uh, with God uh, is still feels the same. Hmm. It feels still peaceful still um important to me uh still like a like a part of my existence that i'm um is is really powerful really really meaningful to me um and not even to get into the side of it because i know it's so funny but um it has felt i'm not a super political guy uh but i have never felt more disconnected from american christianity uh, then since, uh, Donald Trump was elected, I had never felt more disconnected from, uh, my, my own faith group as a whole in that, uh, not that I even, not even to get political on it, but, uh, that is a, it's just been a strange thing to me culturally that it, it seemingly shifted so hard. Uh, and it didn't make sense to me and it has left me feeling, uh, kind of an outsider within Christian culture. So, uh, maybe if you don't mind, unpack yeah, we can that. jump into any like, of that. Unpack I'm that a little to. bit. Yeah, like yeah. what, what do you mean by, uh, there was a few things you mentioned, like your theology has shifted, but then you got specifically into that. What about that has felt, has felt a void created? Yeah. It, uh, it really started upsetting me with the um, when Christianity felt like it became so entwined with the Republican Party mm-hmm. and the Republican Party being not like the Republican Party that I remembered in, from the 90s. Mm-hmm. Uh, and it just started feeling um, like it was unaccepted to go to a church and not be a part of that, not be affiliated with that. Uh, hmm. And uh, that was just something that it just bothered me. It, it, it didn't, didn't sit right with me. It didn't vibe with me. Um, mm-hmm. And really, I've opened, uh, I even just recently read, read a book uh, by this guy, Thomas Ord. Uh, it's called Open and Relational Theology. And, and not, not to plug a theology book here, but it is uh, really kind of helped brought a lot of peace to my life and it it wasn't like throwing out uh my values or things that i believe in even but it was it very much reframed the concept of why is there pain and suffering in the world Mm -hmm. how does an all-powerful and loving god allow atrocity you know uh allow pain and suffering allow things that are just unfair and the way that he reframed it and that uh, felt very peaceful and it felt like actually the best answer that I've ever heard anyone give as far as that where, um, you know, I, I don't mean to oversimplify it in this thing, but it's it's the that the scope of God's control is different than maybe we have previously thought. 
Okay. And uh, it doesn't make uh, God uh, the creator, God the uh, great love that is in all of us. It doesn't make it less powerful. It doesn't make it less um, in control. Uh, but his maybe his control has a different. It looks different than we than we thought it did. Because our perspective on control as humans is very specific. Yeah, yeah, exactly. And and also it's the idea that we as humans are part of that love. Like we are part of God's love. Like that's that's like a really cool thing to think about. Like yeah. we are like literally an extension uh, when we are in love. You know, like when we're acting in love. Like when we are. Um, I don't know. It just like hit me in a different way. Uh, yeah, it's, I, I don't feel at home when I go to church. Uh, I'll just say that. It, it feels uh, uh, moving down here. We were very aware of, um, you know, Florida. You joke about it, but it is uh, extremely right wing. Uh, and we were like, OK, that's fine. You know, like. Uh, uh, and it is. I'll just say this. It is less diverse than I had expected. Yeah. Yeah. I grew up here most of my life after moving from Ohio. And yeah, mm -hmm. it is, it is not very diverse. Yeah. It's not diverse. Yeah. So it is, <laughs> yeah, uh, yeah. that's all I, I'm not trying to make a political point here. Uh, but I also, uh, that is something moving from, especially the area of East Nashville that we were in and, mm. uh, or the area of Nashville we we're in and East Nashville is, yeah is very left-leaning but i didn't even really realize that until i moved down here i was like yeah. oh my goodness yeah it's people think very differently are around me uh and it doesn't mean i can't interact with them the same but it's it's different and it was i was talking to a, a comic book artist and somebody big into the comic book scene as it came up through the 70s, 80s, and uh -huh. 90s. And he's from Chicago, outside of Chicago. Um, I would say, you know, very, uh, from from a political standpoint, we would kind of be on somewhat opposite sides of the track. But, he, but I enjoyed that conversation so much because he said something that really just, I just felt was so right. And it was, if you don't have an openness of mind, you don't ever get to test and sample your own ideas. Mm. And when we're so focused on our own ideas and, and making them known, we never get to test them. Yeah. And so it was just such a fun conversation because he just threw out so many things that some I agreed with, some I wasn't sure, some, you know, whatever. But more than anything, we got to both learn from each other. And yeah. it was such a fun conversation. And I feel like the more we have conversations, calm conversations with people that we don't agree with, yeah. Not that we disagree with. I think yeah. that's a big dif uh, differentiator. Uh -huh. is stop disagreeing. You cannot agree, but also not disagree. Yeah. Um, and that was probably the most fun thing about our conversation is we never disagreed, but we didn't end up agreeing. Yeah. Um, and I just learned so much. He had such a perspective. I asked. He was talking about this fifteen million dollar library that they built in his community, and he was saying how this library has become a center of commerce in this community. It's revitalized a whole portion of the community that was in essence dying. And there's new apartment complexes and mm -hmm. shopping and food. And and it just struck me. I was like, whoa, you know, we keep talking in America, especially the conservative party, um, that the way forward is bringing industry back to America, mm -hmm. bringing production and, and factories. And, and there's definitely truth in that. There yeah. will definitely be industry that is revitalized and, and strengthened through that sort of thing happening in America. But how much you could revitalize a city through what he called the industry of knowledge, mm. right? This library bought, brought commerce and restoration and revitalization to a community. And so I say that to say, like, I didn't, I, I wouldn't have discovered that yeah. If I wouldn't have pursued that conversation and I wouldn't have discovered this whole idea around, hey, let's let's create a learning center and that revitalize the community. You didn't just have to start building things or creating commerce. Yeah, man, I love that. To establish a community and help it grow. That's really cool. So it was it was fun and I and I've just been encouraged to to try and have conversations, not be afraid of where a conversation might be going because Worst thing is I learned something. So. Uh -huh. I have always, uh, yeah, some of my 
favorite conversations about spirituality have been with friends who are atheists, Buddhists, uh, and and really some of the most even vulnerable and real conversations have happened in that context for me. And so that's where um, I think I think that's where I shy away from politics. That just doesn't seem possible in that. You know, I'm I'm not interested in changing anyone's mind. I'm not interested in uh, winning an argument. I'm not interested in being in an argument. You know, that's that's like not the where I want to put my energy. Um, and I do have opinions on how things are going to should be and how they would be. And yeah. like anyone would. Uh, yeah. And I do want to be involved. I do want to be a part of the community, a part of the conversation. Uh, but it's, it's difficult to be. Politics is hard. Yeah, because it is yeah. a funny. It is um, more divisive now than I have ever um, seen it. Yeah, yeah. It's, it's been tooled, so yeah, to speak, yeah. to be a weapon. Yeah. Yeah. So who's uh, who has been the person who's brought you your favorite conversation uh, oh, wow. in spirituality? While while maybe on tour, we'll say that a certain band member or just producer person. Just uh, I think I learned a lot from our guitar tech. Uh, his name is Jonas Latikare. He's from uh, Denmark. Okay. Uh, he used to be play in like metal bands, and uh, now he plays in country bands. He's an amazing guitar player. Uh, but he is Buddhist and I was always just kind of picking his brain because he is one of my favorite people, one of my favorite people to be around, um, has just a never ending flow of positivity. Uh, the way that he cares for people is just infectious. And I was just interested in that. Hmm. And I was always asking him and, and he, and I said, how are you in a, just seemingly in a good mood all the time? And he said, no, I'm definitely not. I, I have hard feelings like everyone else. Uh, he's like, I take a lot of walks. Uh, you know, he, he was talking to me how he um, is able to process uh, his own feelings. Um, and some some of my other favorite conversations have been, um, I am in this group in Nashville and it's, it's, it's not really like group therapy, but the guy who leads it is a, a therapist, is a counselor. Uh, and it's, you know, different different people. It's small business owners. It's uh, people from all ages and walks of life. But there's like 10 guys in this group. And we just sit in there and we talk about our feelings. And we talk about um, things that are going on in our life. We talk about struggles and um, wins and losses. And uh, that has been such a meaningful thing that I've st stayed connected to, you know, so when COVID happened, everything went virtual. Uh, and then I moved down here. So I just kind of stayed virtual. Cool. Uh, so when I'm in Nashville, I'll go to it. Uh, but that group to me has been uh, just immeasurably valuable. Uh, and some of my favorite conversations have happened in that group too. You know, uh, a lot of the people, a lot of the guys in the group are Christians, but not all of them are. Uh, not all of them think the same way uh, politically. Uh, and it's just such a positive space for that, to have that uh, conversation and to really know that we all really care about each other to, as a baseline. You know, we all know each other pretty well. Yeah. Uh, and that has been probably, probably the most meaningful conversations I can recent, recently think of happened in that context. Or, or with those guys, you know, getting a beer after or whatever in that group uh, has been uh, really valuable. So what is something that you've worked through over the years that could have impeded the success of either Ron K or 1981 that that you have to kind of keep tabs on? You mm. know, like for instance... Yeah, we got a lot of things. You, you said this, uh, this <laughs> yeah. your guitar tech from Denmark said he had bad days, but he still had to work through them. So what... Mm -hmm. What's something that you've had to had to work through? Uh, I have a problem showing up. I have a problem being present. I I have to be intentional about that. And I say that uh, as far as being present, you know, with my wife or my kids or my friends, uh, but also being present in a way that it it doesn't always come natural for me to uh, post on social media doesn't always come natural for me to 
um, be a part of the conversation uh, hmm. on a on a bigger level. Okay. Uh, it doesn't always come natural for me to want to create or uh, to put something out into the world. You know, I'm working on this uh, this LVL pedal release uh, for 1981, and it is it's been hard to it's it's difficult for me to put that pedal out into the world. And part of it is fear. Uh, part of it is, uh, you know, are are people gonna like this? Is this uh is this necessary is this unique is this uh is it finished is it good uh you know and all the and and i can answer all those things uh with a certain amount of confidence at this point and i can also answer you know what i love it i i'm going to put it out reading reading part of the rick rubin book has helped where he's he talks about an album being completed but it's really anything creative is uh the moment that it becomes a win is when you release it. It's not when it sells. It's not when it sells a million copies. Uh, the moment uh, to celebrate is when when you put it out into the world. Why? Uh, because you did this hard work. You uh, did. You showed up. You uh, did put in the effort to. You know, in my case um design and build and um I, I actually physically build this product you know yeah, yeah. and ship it out and do all those things uh but yeah i think there is there is value it just in that is the beauty that is uh creating beauty in the world but it's also expression and it's also making the world better through art it's making the world better through your own creativity it's adding uh your voice to the conversation uh culturally uh and i think that that stuff is is really important so <laughs> total shift but yeah, aligns shift. with what we're saying because it's something very different chat gpt oh yeah yeah what do we do to use that to the best of our human flourishing moving into the future man yeah i I'm really excited about the opportunities uh, that are with that. I and it's easy to have some fears about, you know, like what does this mean uh, for us as a people moving forward? You know, yeah. what what is um, the actual materialization of AI is. Uh, it doesn't look like how I pictured it looking. Uh, and in some ways it's more exciting and less scary than I thought it would feel. Hmm. And in other ways it, it does, it feels uh, like a responsibility. I'll say that, that I, I think uh, like with anything, like with the internet, like with um, really any, uh, I don't know what, what category to even put AI in, uh, but really with something like that, there's just, uh, you know, there's a a positive and negative way to use that. And I think that we have a responsibility um, as, as, a, as a collective people of human, as humankind to kind of help guide that as much as we can. But it's, uh, it, it's a strange time. And honestly, yeah, I don't really even know what to think of it exactly, but I am, I uh, most often I uh, think I, I think it's really interesting and cool and exciting to hear of people thinking of different ways to utilize uh, even that form of AI. Do you think it will create more value to art mm. or less? Art being music, a pedal that you created, a painting, anything. Yeah, I mean, I've I've thought about it in the music context because I was like, oh my goodness, they could, a record label can finally type in all the parameters they want and 
they can uh, you know create a singer. They can have a hologram singer that is songs written by a computer, performed by a computer. Uh, that it's it's like oh no the 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 evil empire of uh, major labels can finally just run on its own can dominate. On its own evil, <laughs> uh, yeah, terrible black heart of, uh, <laughs> you know, and uh, in some ways I was like, oh my goodness, what if, yeah, like, what if that is the future of pop music? Does that, does that matter? Hmm. You know, because I, you know, you think of people like uh, Britney Spears or Michael Jackson, I'm like, man, that's, that is not healthy for them. Uh, hmm. I feel like they were victims uh I feel like many uh, people on that level of pop stardom are victims of the system okay. of, uh, I don't know if you want to say the, the corporate greed of major labels or the cultural phenomenon and how difficult that, there's a lot of levels here that are happening. Yeah, yeah. And so I actually thought about it with, with AI in that I was like, man, what if, what if some mainstream pop music was just not actually a person? It's just some amalgamation of uh, a computer. And maybe that's okay. I'm curious because you maybe been... You know, there's no Miley Cyrus. There's just a computer. Yeah. You know? And it doesn't mean that, like... It's crazy. Other things can't... It doesn't mean pop music can't still exist. Yeah. But I, I see it as, like, existing hand-in-hand. Uh, hand. And I... I I think it's funny to think about if I heard a song that I really liked and then I learned that a computer wrote and performed it, uh, that would be mind blowing to me. Cause I would be like, Oh, I felt something when I heard that song. I, uh, that felt like art to me. And that to me also feels kind of like, it feels funny, uh, like comical even, but it feels exciting also. Okay. Do you and, feel like, yeah. and I feel, and I feel like there's no reason for human creativity to ex exist alongside that. I don't, I don't see that as uh, replacing human creativity. But I, I mean, it may be wrong. Who knows? <laughs> you know, like it's. Uh, I don't think any of us know. Okay, that was going to be my question: Is do you feel like human creativity will be more valued for its um, mistakes than its perfections? Yes, and and I think it has. Already, you know, I, th I think that, uh, you know, you you take anything from a Bob Ross happy accident tree that becomes something really cool hmm. uh, versus, you know, like in the studio when you're recording something, uh, it's so important to get that to try to capture that feeling, whether you're it's a feeling while you're, you know, it's like I, I would always joke that it's like you could tell if someone's smiling when they hit the drums. Uh, huh. and I don't know if that's true, but it's, you can feel it. There's a certain, or sometimes there's a very angry song you're playing guitar and you feel, and you feel angry when you play it. And to me, that adds another element that a machine I don't think could do. Yeah. Uh, and I think that we as humans have the ability to feel that emotion put into something. You can sense it. Yeah, there's an yeah. innate connectivity between humans, and so I think that's always going to exist. And and yeah, to answer your question, uh, I do think that there is an ebb and flow of uh, um, stylistically of wanting things to be more perfectionistic and wanting things to be looser. You know, it was like hmm. you can see it. Uh, it, it seems to go, kind of go on a curve where or on a, you know, just back and forth um, where, you know, it's like all the 80s metal hair bands that were everything was perfect. Their hair was perfect. Their recordings were perfect. And then, you know, uh, Nirvana and Pearl Jam come out and it's just everything is it's grunge music. Yeah, raw, you know? distortion. Yeah, everything yeah. is like all about the flaws. It's, it's not perfection. It is not, it's a live performance rather than a perfectly edited studio take. Mm. Uh, and then after that, it's like the boy bands and Britney Spears yeah. and NSYNC and Backstreet Boys. And it's back to like, every, you know, and even in like other kinds of rock music, you know, you have bands like, even Blink-182 or uh, 
it was this whole style of where everything was edited. You know, mm. every single drum beat, even though Travis Barker is one of the best drummers in the world, it was like every single drum beat was edited to the point where I know a lot of their first records, they would do things like they would take one drum hit and actually use that one drum, that one snare drum over and over again. And so... Do you know what the purpose of that was? It was to create uh, like uber consistency. Got it. Okay. Yeah. To make it to make it sound so machine-like, like, for processed. Instance, uh, uh, sorry. The most clear thing you could ever do. Yeah, that's a... Uh, Listening back, it makes sense. Thinking back, it makes sense. Like the da na na da na na da na. Yeah, that was yeah. probably on repeat. Uh -huh. um, Adam song. Oh yeah, yeah. It well, sounds I mean, so there's, consistent. There's a lot of tricks that they do. Uh, yeah, because Tom is a uh, okay guitar player, you know, uh, and and he and Mark are barely possible as singers. Uh, so I think that they leaned into, you know, what it's our voices are edited and auto-tuned and our guitar playing is uh we'll we'll do a million takes and they'll you know they can they the ability that they have to cut things up is unbelievable you know like so it was a skill in and of itself yeah yeah okay. i mean i've i've seen I, i've talked to the engineer that recorded uh miley cyrus party in the usa and she's also done like all the uh, Kesha songs and she's done, and she's done everything country music uh, and watching her edit a pro tool session was unbelievable to me. I'd never seen anything like it where wow. she cuts each syllable it is its own cut. It's auto tune on a hundred and uh, every single syllable is disjointed, but then she puts it back together in a way that makes sense. And that is kind of the uh, um, Max Martin, Dr. Luke uh, kind of style, uh, which makes everything exactly perfect. Dang. And, and to be able to tie it back together and then make it sound natural is literally an art. It is, uh, you know, watching her uh, edit that vocal track and then to hear her say things, you know, like, man, you know, like, uh, how many takes it took to get Party in the USA, uh, Miley Cyrus, to be able to even do that to it. She was like, it took hundreds of takes over months of time. So she's combining a hundred takes and the best of every take uh -huh. into a song. She's taking one syllable of the best of every take. Yeah. Wow. And I don't even know how you listen to that. I, I don't yeah i don't know how do you how, know what the best i don't wow. know i don't understand whatever and i was so i was watching her work and i was like man whatever is happening in your brain and you're just hearing uh, hey, uh, uh, and i'm like i can't even hear what you're hearing oh, whatever you're listening for i can't hear it so then okay okay you brought up britney spears earlier michael jackson yeah yeah these these michael jackson is was an, an incredible performer singer yeah. i mean uh, talent writer yeah yeah why does somebody get big so for instance you said they did a hundred takes for your example was miley cyrus to get it just right why is she big and maybe somebody else who's more talented isn't you talked about the music mm. machine is it is it their idea that they could could they see somebody they can control and uh, that's why they take like what is your just your thought process huh. on that yeah, I think it used to be more like that. I think record labels used to be able to say, okay, we can throw a million dollars at this. Let's see what happens. We can throw $10 million at this. Okay. Uh, and they have to believe in it. There has to be some substance there to start with. Yeah. Uh, yeah. It has to be uh, a sellable personality. It has. They have to have a couple songs that could become hits. Uh, but, I mean, there's countless examples of... Uh, people who did it they followed all the steps and it didn't work yeah yeah absolutely they had all the elements and it didn't happen uh and i don't and i think now uh more than ever i don't think major labels or i don't i don't think the music business music industry as a whole understands how to connect with people and how to 
make something big. I don't think any amount of money, any amount of advertising, any amount of social media hmm. prowess is, uh, is I, I don't think that's applicable anymore. And I think that the only thing that a major label can do is try to harness and profit off of someone who is already doing it themselves. So you think the independence, this is, this is the era of independent artists. This well, is the opportunity, so to speak, yeah, for people yeah. to make it on their own. Yeah, I mean, it's it's oversaturated. Everyone is, uh, um, oh, media oversaturated between social media and uh, the amount of new music that's coming out, the amount of uh, TV shows that are coming out, you know, and and we're in this crazy golden era of TV. I mean, this yeah. is like, yeah. uh. You know, I could have only dreamed of shows with the depth of like Shrinking or Ted Lasso or, uh, and I don't, I'm not even a person who really watches television, yeah, you same. know, uh, but I appreciate the, not only the amount of uh, choices that are available right now, but just the the quality level is yeah. is really wild. You know, I'm not I'm not trying to talk about like how Breaking Bad changed the uh, television industry. It's, that's not where I'm going with it. But it's, uh, you know, we came up with a bunch of different bands in Ohio, and none of those bands, uh, were able to make a. Uh, and they were not able to do what we had done uh, as a as a business, as a cultural impact. And I don't think it was because they were not good looking or they didn't have great songs or they weren't good at playing their instruments. Uh, I think some of it might be timing. Some of it might be luck, opportunity. Um, but yeah, I think the music industry has always had um, more there's more mystery and uncertainty in why some things work mm. and why some things don't. I feel like that's anything in the in the creative space. Yeah, something yeah. just captures people. To, I think of one of the most uh, prolific YouTubers who's become like a mainstream, like Hollywood celebrity. Yeah. I don't know if you heard of Emma Chamberlain, but she just popped off. Just her charisma, her personality, people just just resonate with her. Wow, and it's like. I'm not saying she doesn't deserve that. Yeah. Because they do. And I've watched her stuff and it's it's something. She's just captivating. There's uh -huh. just something about her yeah. that's captivating. And that's music, it's right? Interesting. There's yeah. just something that's raw and real that that an, that an AI couldn't create. An uh -huh. AI could not create Emma Chamberlain. She's I, in a I league of that. her own. <laughs> I get that. And I agree with that. And I... Uh, I'll also say this. I think there's a lot of people that make very fake music. Hmm. Uh, there's a lot of people that make music for the wrong reasons. Hmm. And everyone knows it. Everyone yeah. is aware of that. It doesn't mean that they can't also make a great song. But I think the cultural significance, uh, more importantly, the lasting significance, how it's remembered, how long it lasts, uh, I think that that is directly tied to how important was this? How honest was this in the first place? You know, what, what, it, it's like you think back to like uh, different one hit wonders, you know, from the 90s. Yeah, and absolutely. Things like that. And you're like, what are those people doing that? And maybe they don't have to do anything. That's okay. Like that it, song just set them up forever. <laughs> yeah, yeah. But it's, uh, mm. it is a funny thing to think back on. You're like, and and I can look at it and say, even though uh, I think that song is fake, I can say I still like that song as a pop song. Yeah, you know, I still enjoy it. So, what uh, what was a song that you did that you put so much into, and it's like a song that you're like, this is the best song we've ever made. Oh wow, that is a really difficult uh, question okay. for me. Let's redo that maybe a little bit. What's one of the songs that you thought? would do really good on an album and it just, it was not a big hit. Oh, wow. That not help at all. Oh, <laughs> uh, no, I'll, th I'll, I'll think about it. Okay. Um, I can, I can even use examples off of, uh, like our mm -hmm album from 2004, where when we finished that album, we sent 
three songs to Tom Lord Algae to mix. And he was the guy that had done, you know, Blink-182 and Foo Fighters. He was doing all the, like, major rock stuff at okay. that time. And we sent him uh, High of 75. Uh, what did we send him? Uh, Be My Escape. And my girl's ex boyfriend. Okay. Which was uh, Matt and our producer Mark thought that it was that was going to be the biggest song. Okay. And no one cares about the song. That's not, it, the song is not really that good. It's like kind of cute, but kind of cringy. It is uh, like when we play that album through, uh, it's very skippable. I think even for our biggest fans. Hmm. Uh, that song. But that was the, one of the ones that we spent the majority of our budget to have a guy mix. Wow. Uh, versus like when you compare it with another song like uh, Who I Am Hates Who I've Been yeah. is one of our bigger songs. And that was one of the first songs that we had worked on for that recording. And I think it just kind of like it it was it was one of the first songs and it just kind of existed. We didn't we didn't really think about it. We didn't really overthink it. We didn't really think it. You know, we sequenced it late in the record. Uh, it wasn't like none of us liked it, but we just didn't necessarily think it was a standout track. And now to hear back on it, like that's one of people's favorites. That that one actually was. Uh, maybe our highest charting song at some point, you know, really? like Cap uh, Capitol Records actually took that to like top 40 radio and it didn't really work, but I think it got to like number nine at one point or something, nice. you know, so like it's funny to think about uh, just on that record. Those are two examples of, of songs that I had different expectations for. You mentioned earlier about just putting your pen out and just writing something out really quickly and it just... It just working. Was yeah. that one of those songs that it just works? So you guys kind of not ignored it, but just didn't kind of pour more yes. and more into it. Yes. Yeah. Was, mm. That's exactly right. Um, and yeah, some, sometimes it's hard to know. Uh, there are clearly, there are many times when, uh, you know, we'll be getting mixes back for an album and I'll just be like so excited about a song and I'll get mixes back and just be like, oh, this didn't turn out, you know, like. And sometimes we'll even choose to hold a song back in that case, or we'll choose to uh, redo some things, uh, rethink it in some way. So, You mentioned creativity earlier is expected to be something outlandish and new and exciting, but now your definition is just more of getting it out there, tinkering, exploring. Mm -hmm. How much of creativity today because of social media is actually somewhat of your previous version of creativity do you think or do you think there's still a lot to be found in your now current version of what you say creativity is yeah i think that i'm just scratching the surface of uh what i want to create you know and, and even thinking of i've never put out a solo record hmm. and that's something i want to do yeah uh i've worked on songs for it I, i've never like put studio dates on a calendar i've never shown up in that way of like finishing and doing and um i almost have a couple times uh but that definitely is a goal for me is to do something just completely on my own um in a way that I feel is, is releasable to, to be able to put that out into the world. And I really do think that that would be the win for me is to put it out. Um, and yeah, I think there's a lot more creativity to come. Uh, it's funny. I learned a lot. I started becoming interested in photography in 2012 or 2013 when our drummer quit because he used to run our instagram page and our band facebook and things okay. like that and he's a great photographer cool. uh so he uh his name is ethan and he uh when he quit the band it's i was like oh i guess i need to i need to do this and i started learning about photography and editing and i didn't know anything about it but i started being i that started to feel like a creative outlet for me 
uh, to be able to just take a picture that I felt I felt something or I thought was beautiful in some way. Hmm. Uh, and that, that was a cool experience for me to uh, learn how to express myself in that way. Uh, and I still love photography. I love taking pictures. I love um, capturing uh, life in still form like that, I think is like uh, something that I'm just very excited about. Uh, and <clears throat> I feel very disconnected from social media uh, in the last couple of years. And I feel uh, old and disconnected from like, I was like, I don't want to make reels. I don't really want to be on TikTok. I, I open it very rarely yeah. and I don't feel connected to it. I'm like, this is not, I don't even enjoy scrolling. And, you know, I, of course there are amazing, hilarious, meaningful video content makers and people that are you know um of course i i appreciate that but i don't want to see like video after video after video it just feels exhausting to me um sensory wise yeah, yeah. Uh, it's it that's not the experience i'm after i so i rarely open tiktok it's less than once a month probably and I realized that I probably should have more of a voice in that. I should learn how to show up in my own way, even for uh, my pedal company or for the for Reliant K, you know, for the band. Uh, to I, I feel like a sense of like, oh, this this is a way that I could maybe learn how to show up in my own way, but I haven't yet. So in a sense, you've stopped telling a story for those maybe those entities yeah, yeah if, in a visual way in a putting yourself so out to the public yeah. way. Yeah. And it's, I don't know exactly why that is. I feel, uh, just a little disconnected from social media as a whole. I've disconnected I've from the, like the intention, the mindset. When you say disconnected, uh, what do you mean? I feel disconnected, uh, personally from it. I feel disconnected. Like there's no part of me that really wants to uh, interact or be vulnerable on mm. it in any way. Uh, but I'm I'm trying new things. Uh, I just started a Substack, and so I've been like writing in a different form and the more of like a blog type format, and that feels. I don't know, I'm trying it out. Cool. Uh, but I realized that a while ago that I was like, oh, I I don't actually want to use uh, Instagram or social media or Twitter to say something that is real and personal and meaningful to me. That doesn't feel like the right format. Okay. That doesn't feel like the, um, that's not where I want to have that conversation. That makes sense. And yeah, I, I, I think it's interesting, but I'm also still open to uh, growing, into changing, into um, being. I want to be a part of the conversation. I want to be a part of the community uh, still. What conversation do you want to be a part of? What oh, yeah. about it is that makes you want to be a part of, but you feel disconnected? Yeah, I mean, I think it's just this human need for, uh, I don't be, have friends. Uh, that is, that I think was the main catalyst for starting the pedal company hmm. is I was trying to think about things that I love, things I love doing. Yeah. Um, you know, I thought about uh, going back to college to be become a counselor or a therapist. I thought about um, becoming a golf instructor. Really? Yeah. Do you golf a lot? I, I don't golf a ton, but I love it. Okay. Uh, I played in high school. Yeah. And I just really enjoy it. It's a, it's, it's a peaceful experience yeah. for me. And I've never, since high school, I haven't done it um, competitively, but it's just something that, that I love. And, and I also enjoy teaching in that context. Like I enjoy um, understanding something with a lot of complexities and intricacies and um, trying to help, help people you know, and help people enjoy it and not, and not to, uh, for any real reason. Um, but I say all that to say, 
I was thinking about social media at that time uh, when I launched the pedal company or when I when I really started focusing on it uh, on 1981 inventions. And I started thinking of uh, who are my friends online, you know, looking at my last 20 posts, uh, eight of these are about my guitar gear, my pedal board, my guitar, my a recording situation, playing a show. It, it's like very much of this is um, about what gear I'm currently interested in and I'm talking about it. And that feels like naturally energetic. Okay. Uh, but also I was like, I was like, man, I am friends with 25 different small boutique pedal builders. Hmm. And these are people that, I message with these are people that I hang out with when I'm on tour and I'm going through uh, Portland or Minneapolis or whatever, you know, and I'm, I call them up and be like, Hey, you want to go out for lunch and talk about whatever pedals you're making now? I was just really interested in it. Yeah. And I was friends with them uh, from the context of the band, from a context of I am in a touring band that. I'm constantly looking for something new. I'm interested in what people are making and creating. Uh, and it feels important to me creatively uh, to be a part of that. And I just, I don't know, just, I think that was kind of a catalyst in realizing that I wanted to do a, a guitar pedal company of my own because I was like, man, mm. these people are, I'm already friends with these people. And I had so much support uh, from them out of the gate like these were all I had I had so many people that I could literally just get on the phone and be like hmm. hey I'm having a problem sourcing sourcing enclosures uh can you help me I'm having a problem finding knobs uh and I had okay. so and so much support you know from from the beginning and that that is something to me that is was really unique but it felt not like a natural progression natural progression to do the pedal company because like are, are you yes. saying that this was before you started 1981 you had these relationships yes because you were tinkering with pedals uh-huh but you hadn't said i'm gonna create a pedal company yes okay so the pedal company came out of this natural desire to tinker and mm -hmm. to build yeah so how is that relation to the social media aspect Oh, yeah. So the social media part, I was literally looking at my friends on social media, yeah. at people that I interact with on my personal account. Yeah. And I was like, I, I am friends with so many people that build guitar pedals. Yeah. Like that is, I think I'm friends with all of them. You know, like it's, I can't think of many people that I'm not friends with that, that are in that industry because I love it so much. Hmm. And so and so that felt like that and but then also the or that felt like a uh a match okay and then also i was uh just constantly posting pictures of my pedal board i was gotcha. constantly like i was like this is what i want to talk about naturally uh and moving into the space of uh guitar gear felt like a it f it felt right so right now have you lost that love of communicating your love of guitar pedals? Is that why oh, you're saying yeah. you feel disconnected? Um, well, I think it's just changed over time. Uh, and uh, I know I don't think I've lost that love. So that's an interesting point. Yeah, I, I feel that the environment has changed. Okay. And... It's not that I, I still text people, friends of this, you know, yeah. I, I still like talk to people about this, uh, but I don't, I don't feel drawn to post about it publicly as often. It, it takes, it's more, um, it, it takes some perseverance, I think, for me to intentionality to uh, be active on social media uh, in a way that I think, you know, would only benefit my company to be more active yeah. uh, and to be more personal. Uh, it's difficult for me to play to point the camera at myself. Gotcha. I've started doing things where I'll put a camera on a, or put my phone on a stand and I'll face it away from me so I can't see it. Hmm. 
Uh, and also the video and, and audio is way better. I didn't even realize that the audio is incredibly better when you're using that camera. So just just to hear you talking. I didn't realize that either. It is wild. Uh, and yeah, you get better video. Yeah, can't beat that. And that has helped, but I still, I mean, uh, th- that is a challenge I'm giving myself. That is an area of growth mm. that I would like to um, be able to feel more comfortable um, just being myself in video and on, in social media. And, and because I do, I do want to be a part of those conversations. I do want to be, uh, interacting with people that I am friends with. I want to make new friends. I want to, you know, uh, feel, I, I think that is the positivity to me of social media. You know, yeah. I've never been one of those like doom scrolling or, uh, I've I've definitely like wasted time on it. I've been disconnected from my family because of social media. Hmm. Um, but I have I I don't scroll social media and feel jealous. Okay. I don't scroll social media and feel um inadequate or unsuccessful or uh sad. I it helps me to just see I, I just like seeing what my friends are doing. And so that's the conversation I want to be a part of. Okay, that makes sense. The song "Look On Up." Uh huh. Where did that come from in relation to what we're talking about? Yeah, that was a song Matt wrote. That song with Adam from Al City. Oh, and love Al City. Yeah, yeah. So Matt was actually a writer on a couple of his, a bunch of Adam songs over the years. Cool. So he worked on him on Fireflies with him, yeah. and he worked on a lot of the songs on that first record. So Matt, Matt's actually singing all the background vocals on the song fireflies really yeah so it's kind of funny uh uh kind of twist and turn but uh yeah matt was writing that song with adam and he called me one night he was like hey can i come to your house it was like 9 p.m and i was like sure and he came over he was like i just really wanted to play this song and he never does that like so especially play guitar especially and now okay and he played that song and i remember he was just he was he was like shaking he was like not in fear not in anger it was just like i could feel an emotion coming from him hmm. and i was just like Whew. i was like we got to i was like we got to track this yeah. I was like this is cool yeah i was like i love this uh and he wasn't sure what he wanted to do with the song at first so the hmm. song actually sat for Almost two years uh, from that point, uh, he tried to record it multiple times for a solo uh, record that he had been working on that I don't think he ever put out any songs from that iteration of that. And even um, I helped him with some of the recording for that. Uh, There were some versions of Look On Up that I played the guitar on the track for his solo thing uh, that he never put out. And so that version of Look On Up, Look On Up, that is out. Uh, we almost put it on air for free. I don't know exactly why we didn't. We just kind of felt like it didn't quite feel it. The song was much older than any of the other songs, and really? it okay. just, in our mind, felt disconnected in some way. It okay. felt like a little bit of a left turn that was unnecessary in the album context. Yeah, it came out as a as a single, right? As just a single. Yeah, yeah, okay. yeah so. And and I think we liked the idea that Air for Free was all just me and Matt writing on it. Okay. Uh cuz we had done, you know, things before and like Collapsible Lung was you know, we worked with a bunch of different writers. Okay. Uh we had had a lot of different experiences and Air for Free felt like a return to the core of who we were cool and just trying to be ourselves not trying to make uh super commercial music and not trying to be worried about uh sales or tours uh we were just like let's do our own thing i want to know about deathbed yeah one of my favorite songs yeah that, of your guys's entire disc- discography i guess it's called uh-huh uh tell me about deathbed yeah it's uh Another really powerful song. Uh, it is written just about a character. And Matt has actually written multiple songs about that same character, about 
uh, growing up in Ireland and moving over here and during the potato famine. And, like he has like very specific. Interesting. Uh, we we keep talking about making like a life story of this one character. It being like a full album. Yeah, yeah, wow, or or just be... even a collection. Cool. Yeah, because here, yeah, what is an album now? But uh, you mean like how many songs or what is it? Yeah, just specified? it's a, it's a collection of musical. Yeah. Okay. Um. So yeah, Deathbed. Uh. Really powerful song, and we had a lot of fun making it. It was uh. I mean, talk about overthinking a song a corporation a recording process uh that one is i don't know if you'd find a a better example of overthinking every single element uh but we had a lot of fun with it you know and we would go uh we spent a long time uh tracking that song uh mark our producer was very um put a lot of his own personal time and energy into uh, making that the unique kind of thing that it is. Yeah. It's, so. yeah, it's amazing. And, and it's, it's a really powerful mm-hmm. sentiment. I think that, that people can relate to, you know, it's a, it's kind of a sad song by nature in that, yeah. you know, it's a character who's, who's dying and thinking back on his life and things that he wish maybe would have gone differently or that he had done differently. Um, but I also think it's like a really cool picture of, uh, grace and forgiveness and beauty and uh i don't know it's just a, an interesting uh snapshot of uh it, it allows you to take a step back and and uh and think for a minute i, yeah. I, I like that about the song yeah uh through the years uh, i've heard a lot of people about owning or not owning their music do you guys own most of your music or is most of your music owned by a label yeah so everything's kind of in flux for us we've always uh we've always had a little bit of a disconnect from the business side of it okay and have just been more so like okay are we um are we doing okay here you know like is this working and i think we're even trying to figure that out moving forward in uh how uh how to do that you know how how to be a band and a business and creative and also do other endeavors and family and life things that happen uh but uh to, to answer your question uh we do own some of our music okay. uh we have had multiple record deals publishing deals over the years and so when you look back at our catalog, you'll see, uh, you know, okay, Capitol Records owns this. And uh, I'm trying to remember the name of our current publishing company. You know, it's but it's like, you know, we'd signed a deal uh, with Songs Publishing in 2009, I think. Uh, and then, uh, you know, th- there's just been different things, whereas our earliest stuff was Goatee owned the master and publishing side. Uh, and I think some of those like we're getting back or we have back, but I don't, I don't even know. Okay. Like, honestly, I'm like not super plugged in to what's happening. Is that more of Matt's side of things? No, like neither of us do. Okay, yeah. Like interesting. It's, and that is actually kind of burned us in the past. Like we had a manager in 2003 that, uh, he had been taking money from us for years. Yeah. And f- we know of at least three hundred thousand dollars that he had kind of siphoned yeah. out of the business over time, and yeah. we uh, parted ways with him, obviously, and yeah. cho- chose not to just move forward and take it as a lesson learned. Yeah. But um, man, yeah, we shouldn't have been that disconnected, yeah, you know. Right. So it's it's in a different way now than it was then. Uh, but even recently. Um, like I literally, I don't know where we're going. I have no idea of what is next, and I'm excited for it, but yeah. I also can't really picture it. So we're doing a couple festivals this year. We're doing Furnace Fest and the When We Were Young Fest, uh, and we're doing uh, Hawthorne Heights, the band we toured with, is doing. Yeah. Uh, they they run these festivals now. Cool. And so they're doing one in Ohio. It's called the Ohio's for Lovers Festival, but yeah. it's like 
you know, Jimmy at World and Alkaline Trio, and oh, it's yeah. it's gonna be a really fun day. Uh, so we're just doing these things, but we're like, okay, how do like do we make music? Like, what do we do next? Uh, you know, Matt has all these ideas. He has uh, some ideas that it almost just feels more like orchestral. Uh, very strange, I know, uh, to say. But when you hear the songs, I'm like, man, these are some of the best songs I've ever heard him write. And I feel excited to do that. We also like want to do a pop punk album. Uh, we also want to, you know, we have all these ideas of like things that would be fun to do. Um, and we're just trying to figure out like what path to go on. But recently, you know, we parted ways with our management and business management. And these Dang. are people that were like long, you know, in for the long haul and some of our best friends. And it wasn't on a personal level. It wasn't even on a business level. Uh, but it was like, you know, we, we called a meeting with our managers. We you know, still one of my best friends uh, and just said, we we're like, hey, I, I'm not sure where we're going, but I think that it, it might need to be on our own. You know, mm -hmm. we might we might need to figure this out. We might need to figure out what path we're going on. And does that does that make sense to you? And he was like, yeah, totally. I you know support you guys. Feel free to call me anytime. You know, went like really positively. Yeah. Uh, but when I explain our s current situation with Reliant K, I said it's it's kind of like we picked up the bucket and we dumped it out, and now we're uh, build we're building a new boat, is what I say. You yeah. know, we're like we're trying to figure out like what what things are, what is our value system, what do we want, what are our goals really, uh, and and how can we have fun doing that? How can and how can we make music that is meaningful to us and just enjoy the process? Well, so interesting. One of your good friends, Stephen Keach, he now is scoring movies. Yeah, yeah. Right? So it's like there's so many trajectories that could take place. Think of Tom Tom DeLonge. You, Tom DeLonge? Am I saying that right? Yeah, I think it's DeLonge. Yeah. Okay, Tom DeLonge. Thank you. Yeah. Uh, I mean, had multiple bands yeah, throughout yeah, his yeah. career. I mean, totally. Blink-182, Boxcar Racer, Angel and Dozen Airwaves, mm -hmm. right? Like he can create these entirely new brands. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Um. So is that kind of what you're thinking is like just what do we want to explore from a musical standpoint, from an even hardware standpoint, right? Yeah, it's interesting. I I don't know yet. Okay. I think we're interested in making Reliant K whatever we want to make it. You just recorded something you said a couple of weeks ago, right? You uh -huh. were in Nashville. What, what were you doing there? Yeah, uh, it's a really fun little project, um, but we did – Mainly some cover songs, okay. Uh, but we worked on some new ideas and we're figuring out, uh, yeah, like what what our band even looks like, and mm. um, uh, even figuring out how to do things. We, uh, I used to have a shop space for my pedal company in Nashville, and it okay. was in uh, like the back section of an old church, mm. and there were you know different photographers and businesses that were there, and uh, I, there was a old choir closet in the basement and I had asked the pastor of the church cause the church still met there as well. And I had asked him, I was like, Hey, can we, could I rent this room from you to rehearse with the band? And he was like, Oh yeah, that'd be amazing. So we cleared out this whole room. Wow. Uh, it was essentially just a large closet in the basement of this old church in Nashville. And it was great. We were in there for like a year we kind of felt like we were moving in and we made it to the point, you know, where Dave is in Cleveland, I'm down in Florida, we're meeting in Nashville. And what we had was a setup where we could all show up the same day, plug in our guitars, ready to go. So everything was there. Everything is set. Just brought some essential gear. Yeah. Everything cool. is set and it's ready to go. That's and fun. that was really uh, necessary at the time, I think for us to like restart uh, playing. Uh, and then, it was while we were on tour, we we literally got gentrified out of the building. Oh, uh, whereas man. they they kind of turned it into a uh, like a uh, co working space, that essentially stinks. the whole building, mm. and it's great now. They're doing some cool stuff. And they yeah. have like a speakeasy in the basement of this old church. It, it's cool, yeah, but it wasn't a good fit for us anymore. Yeah, and uh, so since then, it's crazy. You know, we did a tour last year, and 
we have not been very active since then. Hmm. Uh, and part of that is we don't even know where to go. You know, we're like, we used to always re rehearse at my house in Nashville. And now I don't live in Nashville. And it's like, you know, getting everyone in the same place, uh, you know, getting up to Matt's base. Matt's like, we can, we can play in, a, play in my basement. He's like, but it floods a lot. And, <laughs> you know, my neighbors might not like it very much if we have drums going on. And it's yeah. just... You know, so we're actually we're we're looking into uh, renting a house in Nashville, maybe, so that we can crash there. We can set up a little rehearsal space and maybe a small studio. Uh, just kind of start doing our own thing. Cause we're we're like, how can we be active? Because mm. we did have yeah. a space, yeah. And we're like, how can we do this? But we don't really have an operating business per se. So we're like, can we like? Uh, does it make sense to have a monthly expense? You know, how, how active mm. can we be and what, what can we do? So we're just kind of re exploring ways that we can, uh, make music, have fun, you know, tour when, when applicable and, um, find new ways to connect with people who want to connect with us. So, I mean, we talked about, you know, like yeah. the, the Patreon or, you know, like, yeah kind of like that kind of thing but we don't we didn't really want to jump into a patreon or do a kickstarter we're trying to find a we're trying to blaze a new trail i think we're trying to find our own path as far as how we can connect with some of these people um that want to connect with us and how that makes sense in a business as a, in a business what do you want to do like what what actually you think about like how you like to connect with maybe a band that you love like yeah what what would you want to do if you could do it, if you could wake up every day, plug in not a not a, a guitar, but just plug in your life into something. Yeah, each morning, what would that look like? I don't know what it looks like. Uh, we had so we talked about all these things. We talked about the uh, Riverside uh, that you yeah. talked about earlier. Yeah, uh, because we were like, well, maybe we just uh, get on like Zoom, essentially calls with people. Yeah, and maybe we uh, make it like almost like a radio station format, or maybe we just we, everyone knows we're gonna jump on Wednesday nights at seven. Yeah, and me and Matt jump on there, and we can just interact with people, talk to people. That that feels like kind of fun. Uh, but I don't know. Yeah, like we're 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 throwing a bunch of stuff against the wall, and Matt Matt's like, oh, I'm really excited about cooking right now, and I would love to just like carry a camera around my kitchen. Oh, hello. So, like, just yeah, start to infuse that joy of cooking into his. He he has all these ideas. He's like, maybe we can like tell everyone we go get all these ingredients, and then I'll go live, and then we'll all make the same thing together. And like, and he's like, because that's just something that I'm excited about right now. Yeah. It's our everyday life. Uh, it's I would love to talk about that. So, I mean, we're just talking. These are all conceptual, but we have like funny concepts because yeah. he and he's like, what if we made like a radio station that just we kind of did content. We had our own like podcast style shows or our friends shows or like, yeah. uh, he's like, I don't know. What if we did that? You know? And I was like, yeah, that'd be crazy. I don't know how to, we would always joke that like whatever ideas we were coming up with, we were like, that is the least monetiz monetizable concept I've ever heard of, you know, like, but we were like, who cares? Let's do something we want to do. Uh, and let's try to do something that at least allows for more growth. I was going to say, yeah, I think one of the things that I try to do with this or what I'm doing with this, I spent the last five years trying to figure out how to monetize anything and everything around my business with, with reviewing laptops yeah, and stuff. Yeah. And this is the one thing that I, it's been so hard to do. And it sounds weird because it isn't seemingly monetizable because I've just tried to support yeah. my family for the yeah. past five years. And now I'm like, wait, I don't, I've got that kind of handled. What do I actually want to do now? And the answer was meet people. That That's was cool. really my answer. And so I was like, well, how can I meet people? Just start calling them and say, Hey, want to meet? Nobody, it doesn't, there's not really an exchange there. Yeah. But when yeah. it comes to this, it's like, it's a conversation. It's something that we can both share together. I can put it on my channel and get some exposure and create content and and there's an exchange that takes place so though mm. it's not directly monetizable it builds relationships and it mm. lifts other people up and that's like the joy i'm getting out of this is like i get to meet people i get to s share what they're doing and what they're into and and i just love learning about people yeah and it's it's creative like yeah. every 
conversation is something that hasn't happened before. And that's, that's cool. the coolest thing. Yeah, that's really fun. That's a that's an important thing to document the work that you're doing. You know, I think that's yeah. what, that's really that's an interesting. It's interesting to hear you take on that stuff, because yeah, like we we were you know in the studio recently, and I was, I was just so happy. I felt very fulfilled. I felt like this is what I love. I love being in the studio. I love creating and. Mm making new things and putting this out into the world i felt just a just a childish sense of excitement you know about it um and it felt kind of life-giving you know it felt like this is uh i felt like i was in in the place i I needed to be was there a time where you lost that yeah definitely Hmm. definitely i mean i talk about i I talked earlier about my uh, struggle in showing up. Um, yeah. And I think there was a time in the band for for years, uh, probably in the mid-2000s, where I was doing the bare minimum. I was showing up. Mm. I was trying to uh, not feel. I was trying to not interact. I was trying to not um, cause anyone any uh, reason to be upset with me. Uh, but I was trying to disappear. Hmm. And it's interesting to think back on my life. You know, like I was I was doing a timeline a couple years ago of my life and I was and it started to hit me. I was like, man, that was like there's years of my life when I don't I don't really remember. Wow. And I can remember things about it. I can remember, oh yeah, we did warp tour that one year. I can I have flashpoint memories. Or we did a uh, trip to Japan here. We did uh there are things I can recall uh but i can't remember what i was like Mm. i can't remember my life it's difficult for me to remember friendships even from that time uh and so that is my motivation to show up now to connect Mm. now to have meaningful um friendships and relationships and uh and even to show up in the band yeah you know to to not just show up and play guitar but to show up and be a part of, uh, you know, I kind of think of myself as a as a producer uh, of the song, and I didn't always think of myself that way. So you um, thought just one instrument in the overall band instead of the overall vision. Yeah, yeah, and now I, I have a lot more um, confidence, and uh, I have a a lot more peace about showing up in that way that like I, my involvement in this is changing what this ends up being. And hmm. I feel excited about that. It, it, it changes the trajectory of this uh, group creative effort that we're working on. Was there something that caused that to have doubt? Like were you initially into it and like that, felt that vision or is something you never had and then it developed hmm. over time? I think I always felt like I needed to stay out of the way. Hmm. Uh, Matt and Mark were so, I don't even know the word. Like they're, they're kind people, but they're very, it it was just like, they were intense, you know, like they were just rolling. They were just doing it. Uh, They were, uh, had a, I always felt kind of like steamrolled early on. Hmm. And so I learned to just kind of stay out of the way that felt most peaceful to me. Okay. Um, but later I learned how to, uh, be a part of things and, and not necessarily feel like I need to just disagree because that's what I would do early on. I would say I was kind of a naysayer. I was kind of, you know, I would only really speak up if I thought something was bad. Okay. And I thought, and I was trying to help, you know, I was trying to make it better, but instead of, but I was doing it in a way that I didn't really have to show up. I didn't really have to be vulnerable and have my own ideas. I didn't really have to. Um, hmm. And that's not even to say that I wasn't a part of the writing. Uh, I mean, there were songs on uh, each of our albums that I've, you know, been like the main writer on. Cool. Uh, but even those songs, it was kind of like I would. I just kind of like let it happen. You know, I kind of like let the process happened to the song rather than continue to stay 
involved in that conversation. So you would kind of kick it off and then just be like, all right, I yeah, did my part. Yeah, it's, hmm. that's an interesting uh, thing to look back on. Uh, and then I think later I learned to um, be more involved, but it really wasn't until I thought about uh, what it would be like to be a producer, what it would be like to think about the track as a whole and to think about, well, what does it need? Does it, does it need a guitar here? Or how many guitars does it need? Uh, you know, it was earlier on we would do, you know, just layer guitars, layer guitars, layer, you know, and it was just, that's how many guitars go on a record. Uh, I think five, there are five scored in seven years ago was the, probably the culmination of that, of that, uh, wall of guitars so how many guitars would you play for a single song on oh, i mean album? on that on that record i mean 14 18 so you would literally play each track as in uh no i would add, add that many different tracks on it man but for like one one guitar one guitar on that album was i would do i would have one guitar with one sound and it'd be a left and right and I would do another guitar with another sound, and it'd be a left and a right. And would that you was, record and with that, multiple mics? And yeah, and that was one track. My word. So every track was like four performances. Oh, my goodness. Wow. So, so the complexity of that, the depth, the, the, there's, there's so much there. Yeah, but it also kind of like just softens and blurs hmm. the... You know, that, that I think is our most produced album. That was a Chris Lord Algae mix. And that was Howard Benson produced. Okay. Uh, you know, so he had just done like Huba Stank, The Reason. And mm. he had done, yeah. um, I'm trying to remember. He's he's done a lot of like very successful uh, rock rock music. So continuing down the thread of where you're going, what is your... What is next for 1981? You're currently working on this LVL pedal. Yeah. Do you want to be a shop of multiple pedals? Are you trying to build a pedal arsenal that you've, your dream pedal board? Yeah. My goal with 1981 is to make pedals that I want to use. Okay. That is my only goal. Okay. Uh, so it's not about ever making an entire arsenal of 1981 pedals. Uh, it may at some point even include uh multiple versions of the same style pedal where mm. i may choose to use one or the other maybe maybe i have one in my rig currently or my touring pedal board but maybe i don't uh so it's but the uh reason why each pedal exists is that i want it i want to play it that that's what i i, I don't want to just make a pedal because it's good I want to make a pedal because I want it and because I want to express something uh, that I feel like is uniquely me uh, through a guitar pedal. Okay. Whether that is an effect uh, or, you know, so my pedals right now are very simple in concept in the way of guitar pedals. You know, they're not, it's, it's not doing a lot, but there is a lot of complexity and subtlety uh, in the design. Okay. Uh, and it is something that, uh, when I think of moving forward with 1981, it's, it's like, yeah, of course I plan on, I'd like to do a fuzz pedal. I'd like to do a delay. I'd like to do a reverb. I'd like to do a, a tremolo. I'd like to do a chorus pedal. You know, like there are, I, I have a list of like 14 or 15 pedals that I'd like to do. Wow. And I don't know exactly which one I'm going to go to next. Yeah. Uh, I may even start on two at the same time. So because the, seeing how long the, these first two pedals have taken me to You're put like, out. Uh, I don't want to be 80 by the time I get two yeah, more pedals yeah, out. Maybe, <laughs> I'm, I'm not trying to do like the Sufjan Stevens uh, saying he's going to record a, one album for every state. And he only does two uh, of the states. You know, like, uh, I'm not trying to put myself in uh, and that kind of thing. But yeah. I, I would like to make more pedals. Uh, but my goal is, yeah, not, I, I don't have this grand idea of, I want to play all 1981 branded things. It makes know? sense. And I've, I've, I've been kind of interested in deconstruction of branding recently and of, um, 
you know, I'm kind of taking my, even the packaging for my new pedal into like a, it almost feels more handmade and more like, like a zine, more like I printed it here and did this thing here. Uh, and that just kind of feels right to me for, for right now. Okay. Just explore that. What do you, what do you mean? Yeah. So I, uh, hired this guy who does great work and does packaging work okay. uh and my thought was i want to make like an iphone box because okay. my box right now is very um arts and crafts uh it's very uh etsy okay <laughs> it's very uh basic okay it's uh and i and i love branding you know i put i put branding on everything and I have sold, you know, a thousand mouse pads, you know, I've cool. like, I've, I, I love doing t-shirts. I love doing, uh, all sorts of things. I, I, I'm, I have a lot of excitement about doing those things. So I was, I was like, okay, I need to have, I want this really crisp packaging. I want it to feel, you know, have like a foam molding around it. And I want it to feel like, like a, like a fine jewelry yeah. piece, yeah. you know? And as I as I worked through that, and he had some great ideas and great designs, and we were doing um, revisions and getting samples made, and the more I thought of it, I was like, you know what? I think I still just want the big box. I I I just want it to feel like this for now. I think I think for even a little while longer, and that and that feels like the right move to me, even though it was kind of a, a waste of effort and time and money <laughs> to explore that. But to me, it felt like a uh like it was necessary to explore that yeah to okay. to fi to find out that that's actually not the direction that i'm after and so into the deconstruction like i am interested in doing things that are right now in this season uh instead of just putting my logo stamped on everything I'm interested in doing things that maybe don't even say 1981 inventions. Uh, and similarly with the band, you know, like mm. that kind of idea of um, just making something for the sake of creativity, you know, mm. making something that is not meant to be uh, monetizable, you know, as a, uh, like, I'm not trying to make a billboard, you know? Yeah. Uh, in this stage and, and it's not that i think it's wrong i actually think some some of my favorite shirts are you know huge 1981 huge reliant k like i i love that kind of like uh straightforward i think that can be really powerful yeah uh, but right now in the season i don't know i've just been drawn to this uh handmade i think it feels just like my personality i think it feels like a way to be creative and a way to communicate that there is uh, a lot of my effort in this pedal, uh, but a lot of my feeling is in like uh, it, it means something to me. It's meaningful. I think it goes back to our conversation about Chat GPT, right? Like, yeah, real, tangible, raw, messy, mm -hmm. imperfect experiences yeah. Yeah. are great. I mean, think about marriage, right? Like, mm -hmm. Marriage is not perfect, yeah. but it's the imperfections that end up creating what you love most about life with your partner. Yeah, yeah. It's, wow, remember how, how pissed off I was that day. Wow. And now yeah. remember how funny it was now that we're looking back at it. And, and it's all those intricacies. Or remember when this child fell off the bed or that child punch this child in the face. Yeah, yeah. What a mess that was. That's never or, happened to us. Man. Oh, really? No, yeah. it hasn't. Oh, not, yeah. <laughs> I can it name. <laughs> it's just one of those things, you know. It's it's the imperfections that that bring the true texture of life. Yeah, I think that's that's a beautiful way to say it. Um, and yeah, that's that that's kind of what I'm after. You know, yeah, in, in music, and uh, expression, in art, um, that, and that's the kind of stuff that I'm I'm excited about. I even think about like this. You have this power box over here. Uh -huh. um, remind me of the name of the company. Oh, uh, Conway Electric. Conway Electric. And I, I saw it as we came in and we started plugging gear in and you set that out. And I thought, that is the coolest power box I've ever seen. <laughs> and I think like even just something like that, like 
I'm not saying do this, but hey, do you guys want to do a 1981 power box? Yeah. And that you can order it with your pedal and it can be, you know, I just like. I've never even thought of that. That's a great idea. Yeah, I love that. Even stuff like yeah. that. Like maybe even you're not the one who made it, but those collaborations are, are yeah. so cool. So fun. Yeah. Um, And that's the power of building a brand in a company is that there can come a point when everything doesn't have to be branded like you're saying. Uh-huh. Because you have fans of the idea not just the name, not just yeah. the stamp, but the idea of what you're doing. And that and that's kind of part of it. Like when I come in your in your studio here, I just I want to pick up a guitar and start playing and I don't even know how to play. Oh, well, I don't I'm just like I want to go home yeah. and I want to start playing because it's like I feel your who you are in this room. That's really cool, man. That's, and yeah, sorry. That's meaningful, yeah. That's yeah, cool. and and yeah. I think that is something that I imagine if I could share with the world, that is what I'd want to share personally. If I if I were in, you know in your position, I would want to share what it feels like to be a part of this studio, you know. And I feel like that's that's our, that's what you're doing, 1981 pedals. And I feel like oftentimes as as the human condition is to feel like people don't want to be really that close to you, mm. um, or we're afraid to bring people that close to mm. share what really like we like all these weird intricacies and you know these things that make us feel at home mm-hmm. and i'm gonna rant here for a moment but i feel like that's the probably the, one of the coolest things about websites like uh huckberry and gear okay. patrol yeah is like they're collecting all these things that they find interesting and then all of a sudden they have this following around all the gear that they love and mm. that's what you were doing like back when you said yeah. you were really posting to your instagram and if i could encourage you like don't lose that yeah that's a that's a cool way to think of it that's you come in here and like i said there's just so many cool things that i'm like Tell me about this. And where did that come from? And uh-huh. it's just neat. I think I always have wanted to do um, a retail side as well. And I, I would love to, I'd love for it to not really have a theme. Hmm. You know, like maybe I have everything from like, you know, vintage guitars or pedals or vinyl or yeah. art or like uh, running gear. You yeah. Know? Like yeah. Uh, whatever, you yeah. know, like flip-flops like i don't I, like i don't know yeah it's think about different things that i was like oh man i think i could put together a really interesting store that feels cohesive that's like wait what do you have yes and it doesn't even make sense well you're in the perfect place for that and maybe it could even be 1981 you mm-hmm. know it could be even uh somehow attached to that or i, I always have my grand pipe dream is to start a brewery mm-hmm. and then to build everything around that like so you get a large format building and you now have space to do like also a bakery and you mm, can do a coffee shop yeah. and you can do uh you know all the a retail side you i know? love that and just have it feel like a community uh but man i wish i could start 12 companies right now because yes. i'm excited like yes. i'm really interested in starting a clothing company because i love cre- i love creating that kind of stuff and i love personally like making something that is in a way that I would like it. And I wear currently a lot of like Patagonia and North Face and like Nike t shirts, mm-hmm. but I don't necessarily want to have the branding. Hmm. Uh, even, even though I like all of those logos and companies, uh, but I would love to do something that is deconstructed that is more so in, along the lines of like I, I love most things that Patagonia does and I love reading about um, how they run their business and the guy that started it and you know so many things about how they do what they do that I find really interesting and cool yeah and uh, you know even the idea of starting my own clothing company that is so much more focused on like this is about the material and the design and the fit and the uh it's the actual item that is the value. It's not the branding on the item. Hmm. Uh, and I don't even know exactly like how to approach that. And, and I don't want it to be simplistic, but I do want it to be simple, you know? Yeah. Uh, and uh, those are just concepts at this point, but it's, I, I love the idea of like building a story and telling, and like, this is, this is why I wanted to make this because, I wanted to wear these clothes, you know, or this is yeah. why I wanted to make this. And so, and that, and that was the, the same thing about the guitar pedal. 
yeah company and you know between this and the band and you know uh being a dad and traveling and you know all those things it's it's difficult to find the time the energy the uh financially you know that mm-hmm. it's difficult to do multiple things at the same time and but th- those are that is like my pipe dream i have a list of 12 companies i'd love to start you know i think one of the things that i often overlook uh, i was having a conversation with um he owns an agency uh, like an ad agency and he was saying that when he finally let go of the fact that he didn't have to do everything that he didn't have to have mm-hmm. his hands to the to the mill so to speak in order for something to happen yeah his company blew up. Wow. And I just think about like that, like as, as creators, as people who have started their businesses as, as them doing the work, you mm-hmm. know, for you playing music and then building your pedals, you know, but part of your pedal company is the fact that you are building them. But then thinking that, you know, we don't have to create everything that, that mm-hmm. has our magic so to speak yeah yeah like you said earlier behind it Mm -hmm. i feel like that is often an area i could grow in of like hey i want to i'd like to build make shirts too but Mm -hmm. i don't have that resource in my hands today maybe there's somebody you could partner with you know or yeah i I, i've been aware of this since i started is that it's it took a lot of humility and grit for me to be able to start the pedal company uh at the time uh, recently being remarried, the band's not touring. Mm-hmm. I'm needing to shift quickly. Yeah, and it it took a lot of. Uh, this is coming out of a season in my life when it felt difficult to um, do physical things like clean up the room, uh, make dinner, like the, just normal everyday life things felt like a heavy lift to me in mm. that season. Yeah. And so to go from that to go to this thing where it's a very physically forward leaning, like I'm making trips, I'm carrying boxes, I'm like soldering, I am testing, I'm moving stuff around, I'm packaging, I'm shipping, I am like doing all these things. And it felt like such um, an outlet that I didn't know that I needed. And it took a certain humility, I think, to start the company. It took a certain, uh, mm. you know, I I sold a lot of my personal gear to be able to fund the initial launch of this company. Wow. And I was a little sad about that, but it felt important enough to me to do that at that time uh, to make that happen. And... Um, when I think back to, uh, I, I, to go back around to what you're saying is that to me, I, I was aware that it took some humility for me to start the company. And I was aware that at some point it would take humility for me to get out of the way. Hmm. And Interesting. It, right now it looks different than I thought it would. Yeah. And it feels more annoying, if that makes sense, uh, to like, I'm like, no, I don't want to get out of the way. I don't mm. want to. Because uh, um, uh, I've always said this. I was like, I don't I don't want to be a huge company. I don't want to run a warehouse. I don't want to like manage a team that comes to a shop that works. And now I have to worry about their like insurance and 401k and like all and now and then i'm like doing all that stuff instead of like running a business and keeping things small and i think coming from the band side i was so i became so addicted to um running 1981 inventions by myself and that i could have an idea at three o'clock on tuesday and at four o'clock on tuesday i could do that idea you know or like right yeah, in that yeah. moment like i just have an idea done uh, there's there's no like partner board of directors uh manager uh i can do whatever i want to do and i can turn on a dime because i'm very small it's a small operation yeah and i became addicted to that i, I was just like oh i love this feeling and I think now it's taking it's for growth for me, it's going to take um, the not only ability to hand off and trust that other people can care as much as me hmm. in production in running production and yep. um, 
uh, but also taking a little more care to uh, plan and to yeah. um, those are the things that don't come easy to me. Yeah. You know, I, I kind of like operate in chaos to a certain extent. And uh, that is something that I am aware that in order for this company to grow, that is a part of me that needs to grow. So are there things that will only be accomplished through a strong, larger company? Or could you do it at this size? I don't think there's anything that I want to do that I couldn't do at this size. Then why why grow? Because you just said No, that's that's a good point. I think I think for me that growth feels like um if I can get out of the way of running it, um it will growth for me will allow me to then um diversify, do the band, start a brewery, like okay. So you could have more, you could do more of what I you I could want to do, do more of what I want. I think that, that to me feels like the growth. But that said, uh, I just read this book, Small Giants, and it's about um, different companies that have stayed the same, kind of defied the uh, odds of that if you're not growing, you're failing. Hmm. Uh, and they reference a lot of really cool brands like Cliff Bar, um, like... Uh, they, they reference mainly brands that have decided to not go public hmm. that have decided to retain ownership. Um, so they do, they do Patagonia. That's how I found out about the book. They do, um, uh, this guy and, and they do like different people who do different things. Like there's this guy who had a restaurant in New York city and then he had another restaurant in New York city and then another one. And then he started a burger place and that became Shake Shack. And but he still only has his other four restaurants. So he basically sold one of them. The well, he them. allowed it to explode oh, on a the national. And scale. he was always very controlling of his other ones. Cool. Because because he thought in this context, I think this could work. Hmm. I think this could be repeatable, whereas my other restaurants are not repeatable. Gotcha. So discernment uh, and wisdom on where to take what type of company. Yeah, yeah. So he talks about like brewing companies, about Anchor Steam uh, Brewing Company in San Francisco and how it was like an early microbrew, essentially. And it's it's so interesting to me to, to look at it and to say that um, you don't have to continue to grow to continue to be excited and to mm. continue to be profitable. Yeah. To continue to... Um, find that intrinsic energy that we can all kind of feel and I, th I think that's true of the band as well i think of that with um you know uh when we do music when we reapproach what our contribution is uh to music and to life and re-engage with our fans and people that want to interact with us we're like I, I don't, you know, none of us like want to be on the radio. None of us like want to be like necessarily popular. Hmm. Uh, we just want to do this thing that we love. Yeah. And so I think, I think that it takes a lot of pressure off and it um, feels more natural and exciting in a way. Thinking about all the ideas that you want to do, that's something that I, Man, me and my wife, we have so many. We, we have an idea of doing a shop as well. And just, it's something that we want to do and we don't have to succeed. Does that yeah, make sense? Yeah, that's cool. Yeah. Like, and I think that's how the best things are made. Mm -hmm. Like your pedal is just something you want to do. And yeah, it takes resources. It takes time. It takes energy. But, but I just think, man, if we had more people who would just do what they want to do. Mm-hmm. We'd have a lot of beautiful creations in the world. That's so true. Yeah. Oh, I've enjoyed this thoroughly. Yeah, yeah. Thanks and, so much um, for thanks so much for joining me here in uh, yeah. in my garage. Uh, it means a lot. It's been awesome.